listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. Gonna slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On the big, nice burgundy snowboard. All right, beauty of a day today in the booth here at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer. First things first, Stony Buds, how are you doing today? So good, my dog. Woo! Love Woo. that. To my left, we got Mason Aguirre in the booth. Mason, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Good to see you guys. Well, we are happy that you're here. Uh, for the listeners that are unfamiliar with you <coughs> and what you've done in snowboarding and life, I'm going to give them a little, uh, little book report here, buds. Uh, <laughs> so Mason has had a wild journey. He was crushing contests as a Grom. He went on to be a dominant force in the half-putt contest scene in the early 2000s. He's an Olympian. He's got medals in just about every major contest. Grand Prix, X Games, U.S. Open, New Zealand Opens. It goes, the list goes on forever. Uh, he's a crucial member of the Friends crew. He was super pro for Burton and then Nike 6.0. And ultimately had a bit of a rough crash from stardom, battling addiction, and now he is sober back absolutely nailing it <laughs> so he's got a barber shop uh he's taking the hockey scene by storm <laughs> known for burying goals and getting completely surgical with the lumber <laughs> aka the twig oh my god this is gonna be a freaking fun chat um let's just start this thing off by what we did this morning and walk us through it woke up uh got a little little breakfast at your little coffee joint the barista knew you by name, as if you rent a room there or something. Cafe Espresso. <laughs> Give me Cafe one. Espresso. <laughs> yep. Great croissant. Um, went and did a little stick and puck at the local uh, community hockey rink, which was a very nice facility. Great facility. Much nicer than where I play hockey. Um, had a great time. Ran a couple drills. Uh, knocked the rust off a little bit. You know, it was good to see kind of progression throughout it. I'm dealing with a little tweaked lower back, but was still able to get out there we had fun it was a good little way to start the day for sure we had coach buds on the sideline yelling uh, hockey jargon at us mm. <laughs> you learn some hockey jargon today buds yeah you guys are beauticians out there today you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> this uh lettuce head over here it's good flow out the back of his helmet yeah you know? the back yeah. of the bucket yeah yeah back of the bucket yeah. spitting chicklets was he uh, going bird cage or no bird cage he's going bird cage no he's yeah. going visor actually technically. oh yeah bird cage visor. <laughs> It was fun. The boys were dangling. Yeah, we were dangling twig out there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I will say that, Mason, you got a nice clapper. You yeah, know? appreciate it. For that. a couple of hosers, you guys are all right. <laughs> they could always use some work, but, you know, came back into hockey last year after taking, like, I don't know, 10, 11 years off. You got you to gotta continue with, you know, hobbies and passions that you like when you can't ride as much. And I live in the south, in South Carolina, and mountains aren't really close by anymore. And so snowboarding is... You know, unfortunately, a little more far and few between than I'd like it to be. So kind of like hockey's the next best thing and, you know, riding motorcycles or whatever I can do to fill my time, golf, you know, anything. Do you well, have you, a resort close by? Sorry. Um, the closest resorts are in Boone, North Carolina. Mm. So you have like Beach Mountain, App Ski Mountain. It's good. It kind of reminds me of like some small resorts in Minnesota, like Buck Hill or Highland. Like you have just like 30 seconds top to bottom, little line of rails, kind of. Conditions are sort of weather dependent, you know, when it's nice and sunny and slushy, when it's bad, it's really bad. And, um, yeah, it's very East coast. Let's vibes. throw it, let's throw it back to, you know, you got hockey roots cause you're from the Midwest <laughs> and, uh, where'd you, where'd you grow up and where'd you grow up riding? Uh, so I grew up in Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah. Shout out. Um, and I was sort of just a, a product of my, like, environment of having, you know, an older brother that did things. So, you know, my older brother played hockey as a kid. And so as soon as I could remember, I learned how to skate. And <clears throat> at a certain point, my one of my brother's friends quit the hockey team and started snowboarding. And uh, my brother kind of went to my dad and was like, I want to try snowboarding. And my dad was actually, like, on board, too, and wanted to try it as well. And so my, I want to say my dad and my brother started around 91. And then um, <clears throat> I think they were at it for about a year. And then um, it wasn't really, like, this big thing that I was, like, wanting to get into. But I do remember. It was actually funny. I went to see my dad, like, about a month ago. And he had the video, like, he had the VHS tape of when he gave me and my sister Molly our first snowboards. And, like, 
he was like, all right, everyone sit on the couch. You know what I mean? He like pulls out my, my first board was like this oxygen 118 with a cut tail and it had a, a genie on the bottom and it was purple. And I was like, Oh my God, like sick, you know? Um, so it wasn't, it was just kind of this thing that started out as a, a family activity. Um, my parents were divorced. So, you know, seeing my dad on the weekends and stuff, it was a way for us to kind of all spend time together without trying to, you know, argue about what we were going to do. You know, we all enjoyed being out there. And so before all the competing and things and everything like that, it was just a way to spend time with, you know, my dad, a way to spend time with the kids. And, you know, we enjoyed that and it was nice. Were you, I view you as kind of a natural athlete because you, the way you competed and the way you did so well in all those contests, uh, would you say that it came easy to you? I think that I, I think that it be like any type of sport became more natural. The more time I put into it, I wouldn't say that like I was some kid prodigy, but I think that I, um, like I remember for the first five or six weeks I was snowboarding, obviously just on the weekends cause I'm in school. Like I just like could not you know, I could not get off my ass and, and like link a turn, you know, together and stuff. And so it was just like bunny hill and, you know, it's getting cold. I remember crying and stuff. And my dad at this point is like, he's kind of taught us everything that we could being that back then there's no snowboard instructors. People weren't giving lessons. You know, the, the community at my home mountain was pretty small in terms of like guys that snowboarded and stuff. And so me and my sister just kind of figured it out together. But I remember like that first time being able to like put a couple to, or at least like, <clears throat> kind of falling leaf down to where I wasn't like on my ass and was able to like get off the bunny hill. And then it just kind of built from there. But every other sport was kind of the same thing. I mean, I played baseball and competitive golf in the summer and I would like, you know, sit in the backyard and throw out the pitching net, you know what I mean? And trying to get better and stuff like that. And I, I definitely worked at it for sure. Um, you know, seeing people like when I was younger competing against like Kevin Pierce and Sean White when we were Groms, like they definitely seem to have more of a natural gifted <clears throat> athleticism, you know, because I was, uh, you know, constantly like hiking the pipe, hiking jumps, you know, trying tricks, getting frustrated. Um, later on, stuff started to become more natural. I think once I hit a certain point, you know, maybe around 14, 15, you know, I started to like, I started to tick off new tricks pretty quickly. But up until that point, like, snowboarding was and always was hard for sure now going let's fast forward a little bit because the contest scene you were doing usasa and what age did you end up going to nationals um <clears throat> my first nationals was 1997 in big bear um there wasn't a ton of kids in my age group in my region and i think i only did one pipe contest and at the time i could only do like toe side alley-oop and, like, I didn't know how to do backside airs yet in the pipe. So I could, like, do frontside air, skip the back wall, toe side alley -oop, skip the back wall, toe side alley -oop. And I think I could do frontside alley -oop, So that was, like, my ender. You got into uh, nationals with that? <clears throat> yeah, the, I was, like, the only kid in my age group. And so, like, I did the one contest, and uh, my dad had a rapport with, like, our regional director. So 97, you're probably 10. You're that was, like, 9. nine. Like my oh, first, so my first nationals. Okay. Yeah, nine yeah. Old. And so um, I, I think that there was some conversation, and – you know, between my dad and the regional director. And my dad was at this point at racing. My dad was doing Alpine. So he had met a dude in Minnesota that was on hard boots. And like, my dad was like, whoa, teach me that shit. And so he was doing USASA and like the legends age group, <clears throat> you know, and we were all, we were all competing. And so, um, you know, yeah, there was, yeah, I think he said something like, we need more kids in Mason's age group to go to nationals, you know, nobody want to go. So it was kind of on a whim. Like it wasn't this thing that was a big build up, and we went out there and yeah, 97, it was my first time seeing like other kids my age who were also good at snowboarding. Cause up until that point I was like riding with my brothers and then like his friends who were in high school and stuff. And there was maybe one or two other kids at my home mountain that were around my age. But yeah, going up to a start gate and seeing 30 kids in their age group was pretty wild, but um, and that was the first time I competed against Sean and Sean was like, you know, really well known around Big Bear and stuff. And um, I don't know, I think I got like sixth or seventh in pipe and I got third in slope style. And so it was cool to like, you know, Sean got first. So, I mean, it was cool to like go there and, you know, do well, I guess, because it was just like at that point, no expectations. Like I really didn't even know like what I was doing as a nine year old on a snowboard. It was just fun. So. Sean was in your age group? Yeah, yeah. 
So that's when and then you started that, your competitions. With Sean. I guess, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I guess for the first couple of years at nationals, and then I guess once by, by the time Sean was twelve, he was competing in open class. So like, you know, by the time I was twelve, I was still in my age groups. Like I, you know, I didn't do my first pro contest till I was fifteen. So I mean, there had been some time that he had already been. You know, he quickly made that that jump, as as everyone knows. So. Yeah, it was short lived and then we kind of, you know, re aligned later on. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a guest question from none other than Scotty Lago. Here we oh, go. Oh, boy. Mace, what's going on? Scotty Lago here, AKA Tone Deaf, <laughs> AKA Leg Nuts. <laughs> uh, yo, so got a question for you. There's a legendary rap artist. Uh, I forget the lyrics, so I wonder if he could help me out. It goes a little something like this. Uh, Yo, what's up? This is 40 Ounce Killer. Just finished off a 40 Ounce Miller here in the shallow where the fire kindles. And yeah, if you want to help me, uh, <laughs> you know, fill in the blanks, that'd be appreciated. Much love, dude. Oh my God. He's such an idiot. Uh, that would be my dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's your dad? Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. Shout out 40 Ounce Killer. My dad took on this like rap persona like around. I guess when we were all like 14, 15 and, and stuff, named 40 Ounce Killer, which wasn't like the first uh, thing of its kind. My dad in the in the 80s and 90s had a singing telegram service in Minnesota called Velvet Sam's Songgrams, and he would he wore like a velvet jacket and a cowboy hat and uh, say that it was like your 20th wedding anniversary. A family member would contact my dad and give him all this tea about you and your wife or whatever. And then my dad would show up, my dad would write a song and then show up at their party and like, you know, <laughs> embarrass them more or less. And so he became like locally famous in Duluth for it. Had like, <clears throat> I think he did like a song for like a mayor candidate and it was like on the radio and all this stuff so yeah definitely like more of a satire like vibe or whatever and he got like uh he like made a chain out of like you know the house numbers where it has like whatever you know so he took like a four and an O and bought it from Lowe's or whatever and like welded it and put it on a chain and was like I don't know it's pretty embarrassing to be honest but <laughs> but like the homies loved it you know what I mean and so Dude, he like it's amazing so yeah so he he there was a there was a kid at my home mountain that like you know it's cold in Minnesota of course. And there was this kid in my mountain. I think maybe we all have this kid. Shirt off, only trick is a backflip. You know what I mean? And would like everybody knows that. Yeah. Everybody and like knows would him. make would make his own kickers like on the side, dude. And like and like uh yeah, it, it was always like everyone get the fuck out of the way. Joe's doing a fucking backflip. Yeah. And like the snow gun is like going. See him come through with the mitts up to the up to the elbows, the shirts off. So my dad made a song called Backflip Joe. <clears throat> It kind of like ripping this dude that was like, you know, a fame, you know, like notorious at our mountain. Um, and my friend just thought it was hilarious and stuff. And, you know, he like put out a CD and was like giving it to people at contests and stuff. I'm just like, all right, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your dad's it out was there. Cool. It was cool. Did Rockin he actually sw a swig 40s? That's what I want to No, <laughs> no, not at the time. No. I mean, maybe once upon a time. Maybe one of, once upon a time. Yeah. Um, so it was cool. I, you know, looking back now, it's like, I'm, I'm so stoked to have, you know, the fact that like my, my dad and stepmom and my mom and stepdad, like they were so behind the, the dream, you know? Um, so it was really cool, you know? So much so that I heard your dad, this is before Instagram and all that stuff. Your dad used to track down brands, customer service numbers and try to get you sponsored. Or that's something like right. That. Yeah, that's how I got my first sponsor. K2 was my first legit sponsor. Well, my first sponsor was a, was a snowboard shop in Duluth called Freestyle of Duluth. Um, you know, they held, I think they paid for my entry fee, my first nationals. And, you know, I think... And I went there one time, and I had, like, 15 bucks and the cheapest. Like, I bought the che You know, this one snowboard video I could afford was Subject Hawkinson, and that became, like, my Bible. You know what I mean? And, like, I still, to this day, like, totally holds up for like a lot of the footy in there. So I'm like, I'm glad that I didn't have like 30 bucks and get a different movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, my dad, after that nationals, like I was on a K2 board at this time and um, my dad had called like K2 customer service, or, like the number on the back of the like catalog or whatever. And um, basically just like gave him the pitch. He said, you know, I got a son and a daughter that are competing. My son got, you know, third at nationals. Like, what do you guys think? You want to pick them up and sponsor him? And so they were like, yeah. And so, you know, 
you bet your ass I had clickers on my feet that next year, boy. Ooh, you know what I mean? Clickers. Yes, sir. Wow. Yes, sir. I can't believe customer <laughs> service. <laughs> Customer service had the authority to be like, yeah, this guy's. I don't know. Who, I don't know who they connected us to, but my first team manager, his name was Dave Billinghurst. We still chat on Facebook and stuff. He's, I think he started like a sunglass company. Um, Dave was really cool. Like he, you know, would I would always get like next year's gear at nationals and stuff like that, and it was K- really rad. K two clickers were a tough look. Yeah, how'd you like the yeah. clickers? How'd that? A, how'd that help I your mean, style you, out? you can't really miss what you never had. So. I went from like riding in Sorrells and traditional strap bindings to clickers. And like, I guess it just felt like how it felt. But then I went back to regular bindings when I was like 12, you know, which, you know, I didn't go back from there. But at the time, it's like, yeah, I mean, so you just get to the top of the pipe and just click in, man. Like, it was like, you know, <clears throat> had like everyone on this, on the snowboard team, rat, like decked out in them, you know, cause I think, I think my dad ended up getting like some type of pro form through K2 for, my dad ended up starting a snowboard team at my home mountain to kind of like, you know, to be able to kind of, you know, get the kids doing something positive. And, you know, my dad was like the head coach and, you know, it was very unstructured, but, you know, a lot of kids were riding K2 clickers and stuff. And yeah, it, but the quick sell was like, dude, you get twice as many runs in dog. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm I remember e was rocking those things hard. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. You of had the ones riders. with the high backs and stuff. Oh, that's and right. Yeah. They had high backs on some. Yeah. So then how did you end up getting on uh Palmer? Cause that's where it seemed like things started taking off for you. Yeah, it was, it wasn't so, yeah, I've, I think like how the Palmer thing. Well, there was there was a couple things that happened before Palmer. Um, kind of like did the K two thing until I don't really know like really what happened. But I ended up getting on a nitro rep in Minnesota for like a season, and then kind of that season was when we moved out to Mammoth, and so <clears throat> kind of losing touch with that local rep and trying to get in touch with the other rep in California. Mammoth does like a demo days or whatever and I like went up and introduced myself. You know, I'm like I'm 14, dude, you know what I mean? And I'm I'm not anybody. But uh I think like what kind of what came of it was that uh you know, they offered to like hook me up with a pro form on some boots or something like that, but they weren't trying to, you know, whatever. And so those first couple of contests that I did were on like I was riding a Nitro Shadow and it was broken through the bottom of the sidewall, like through the front binding but it was like the only board I had and you know my stepmom helped buy me a pair of boots that year and just kind of rough was rough in it dude had like it's one of those old Burton red helmets that was like blue my whole kit was like disastrous you know what I mean everything was like <laughs> Frankenstein together I had like a planet earth jacket like cinched like all the way it was pretty rough but um Lego actually um introduced me to the Rosignol um people like after like my, my first couple contests and you know, I, I, you know, I was very fortunate that, um, I didn't have this like long come up doing pro events to start to get to like some of the bigger events. My very first pro contest, like legit one was the triple crown at Breck and it was super overwhelming. Like all the guys that I've seen in the magazines, you know, pipe and slope. So I was just doing the pipe contest, but it was just like a lot to be like, oh my gosh, I've seen, because by this point I'm like obsessed with snowboarding. I got all the stuff on my wall, tear outs, you know, stick stuck to my wall from snowboarder, trans world, all that. And so I, and, and back then a lot of those contests, you had like a pre-qualifier, a qualifier, like a semi, and then a final. So you had to go through like multiple rounds if you were like not anybody. And so I remember telling my dad, like, Hey man, if I get like top 30 at this contest, like I would be ecstatic. And I got fifth at the first contest and I won like a couple grand and, you know, it was very surprising and no one knew who I was. And, um, my dad was shooting the shit with Don Bostic, who was running the X games after the contest and he was like we'd love to have mason at the x games and so my dad's like oh let me ask him you know we'll see if you you know (laughs) he's like hey man you know that's don bostic he wants you to come to the x games and compete i was like what so that's kind of how that happened and so that's you know kind of helped me sort of get on smith which was one of my first deals and like met Corey smith from smith and kind of after that i was um I had met the Rosignol people and um, I met Todd Richards at the X Games. And um, this was a cool moment. Like my first day of X Games practice. Now I'm like really starstruck because I'm like Daniel Frank 
Andy Finch, Abe Teeter, like Danny Cass, like all these Ross dudes Powers. that are Ross Powers. Like I'm, this is maybe like my third pro contest is the X Games, and I'm like mm-hmm. super overwhelmed. And I was riding like some, I was riding Todd's like current pro model. And, you know, he came up to me at the bottom of the pipe. He's like, hey, man, like you're Mason, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, no, I'm Todd. And he like had a fresh, like next year's pro model in his hand, like still in a plastic. And he's like, hey, like ride this in the contest. This is my next year's board. And I was like, for sure. Like I just was like so (laughs) starstruck, you know, about that. Um, And it was just such a cool moment, you know, because, you know, um, looking back, it's like, you know, he didn't need to do that for me or maybe he doesn't even probably doesn't even remember it, but that was such a pivotal, um, you know, thing for me. Cause I, I like, I love the movie destroyer and I've watched Todd Richards part so many times trying to copy some of his tricks and things like that when I was really young. And it was just a cool experience. You know, I didn't do well in the X games the first year I did it, but I was in the, you know, I was in fresh new gear and, you know, I had a little bit of uh, things cooking, but yeah, the, the Rossignol thing kind of fell apart and that kind of presented the opportunity with Palmer, which was, you know, my first, like, these guys are going to pay me. And, you know, when you're 15 and people are like, yeah, we're giving you an $8,000 contract. I'm like, God, that's a fuck ton of money. Like, hell yeah, dude. Hell fucking yeah. Let's go. You know, cause I've mowed lawns and caddied and, you know, maybe scrape three, five hundred dollars together over the summer. I go help my dad, you know, and he'd put like a Dremel in my hand and I'm, you know, busting down tile for 10 bucks an hour. So it was really cool to be able to, you know, do that and like go on, you know, shoots and stuff. And first time kind of feeling like I was sort of a part of something. Mm-hmm. That's wild that Todd gave you a board like that because you don't really see that happen a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was pretty cool. You That's- ever given your bro model to somebody just randomly that because he ripped? Not that I can think of. Right off your feet, though? That's cool. Definitely not. That was a cool day because I was on the pipe hiking one hits, and I met Jeff Anderson that day. Ah. And he was, and Jeff Anderson's mom was my teacher at school in Mammoth. He oh, was, and right. he was like, hey, man, you're, you're Mason, right? Like, you're from Mammoth. And I was like, yeah. He's, I was like, yeah, your mom's my teacher. And he was like, dude, let's take some laps, you know, when we're back and whatever. And it's great to meet you. And, like, it was just really weird because another dude that I was like, holy shit, that's Jeff, you know? Obviously, everyone, like, knew... You know, if you lived in Mammoth, like everyone knew Billy Anderson and Jeffy. And that was my really only one interaction with him ever before he passed away. So I don't know, but it was just cool. It was like another guy going out of his way to say what's up to some nobody pipe kid. And, you know, it made an impression on me. So everybody's somebody. That was a cool, that was a cool trip. You didn't really, uh, oh, that was just a trip to Mammoth? Oh, no, that was just, that was at the X Games. Yeah, you my moved, first X Games. You moved, though, from Duluth to. Mammoth you get and, good quick doing that. But yeah, yeah. Do. was your that was because your dad wanted you guys to produce pursue snowboarding or? Yeah, I um, it was kind of like so. I had a a friend that actually you probably know him, Jeremy Grandall. Yeah. He wrote for Tech Nine for Buns. a bit. Mm-hmm. So me and Jeremy, at me he and was your boy. Huh? Yeah, yeah, he was my boy. Me, him, and Zach Marvin were like the, those were like the three of us kind of competing in the same age group in Minnesota and the USASA stuff. So Jeremy and his family actually moved to Mammoth the the year before we did. And uh, they had this independent study school program uh, for high school. And, it, you know, I was, like, talking to him, and he was like, yeah, I, I go meet with my teacher once a week, and I get to snowboard all day, every day. And, like, that's how I go to school. And I told my dad, and my dad's like, no fucking way. Oh, damn, we got to go check this out, you know? <laughs> so we, like, we took a family trip out there in, like, January of – 2002 or over Christmas break or something and like stayed with Jeremy's family and my dad. Um, they kind of like just checked out the area and checked out mammoth. We had been there once before for nationals that the year before that. And my dad really loved it. And you know, my stepmom hadn't been, but, um, yeah, like that trip, like bought a house, you know, like made that was the start of it and stuff. And, you know, I think that I had sort of like, in terms of, because I was like doing a lot of contests and, you know, like the, street snowboarding was kind of just starting to like really get big, but, um, I was doing a lot of events. So I feel like, you know, being in Minnesota, you're kind of limited, you know, with the terrain and what's available, you know, my home mountain, they would like, they would groom the pipe like once a week, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like mammoth where you had, you know, five snowboard parks, multiple half pipes, you know, you had all these other guys living out there. 
This is so. the glory days yeah. of Grenade. Yeah. You know, yeah, you Wayne Knack, you're going to see yeah. Kyle Clancy, Shane Flood from the lift, Danny Cass yeah. is going to be busting. Like, and it was it was popping. What it a was, time to be in Miami. It was. Yeah. It was yeah. super, like, it was super rad. Like, on every, like, every day I would go ride, like, I would see Clancy and Lane, and, like, I would see the, and this is before I even, like, knew those guys, and I was still just, like, cruising around with Jeremy and stuff, but, like, you'd see those guys just hot lapping Mammoth, and it, literally it seemed like everybody was there, you know? And so it, it definitely, you know, one, it allowed me to snowboard more and two, it just like, I went from being kind of one of the better riders at my home mountain or home hill, whatever, to being like a nobody in Mammoth. So it really opened up my eyes to that, you know, like I'm not shit. And if I want to like get better at this, I need to put in some serious like hours out here and stuff. So, you know, it, it's as much as, you know, it's, the dream couldn't have happened without my dad and stepmom making that decision, especially my stepmom. You know, my dad wasn't going to move to California if my stepmom wasn't behind it. So, shout out to my stepmom. Should Julie. we give him the super, yeah, super yeah, yeah, the mom let's and the, dad? Let's give him the super air horn. Yeah. <laughs> the super horn. I mean, seriously, though, for them to do that, that's huge. 100%. Not a lot of parents would just uproot everything so yeah. you guys can be in Shredville. Yeah, my dad had a, a small roofing company that he was able to sell and kind of restarted, like, being a subcontractor for another guy in Mammoth. You know, there was definitely some scary financial times. And, you know, when I went to that first contest in, in Breck that I mentioned, you know, in, like, a no-pressure type of way, like, they kind of told me, like, look, this isn't something that we can finance, like, much longer. So, like, we don't care if you become a pro snowboarder or not, or not you know. Like, we want to be in Mammoth. This was a move for everybody. We were ready to be out of Minnesota. So it was really cool to not have that, like, soccer dad, mm. mom-type parents, you know, that you would kind of – that seems so common in competitive snowboarding. Like, you would see the parents, like, really – in like, almost like their kids living out their dreams, weird totally. shit like that. And I think at the end of the day, like – my dad just wanted to make sure I was having fun, like what I was doing. And so I think knowing that that pressure wasn't there allowed me to ride better. And it was just good timing, dude. Like I got, I got fifth at that first contest and it gave me whatever. I gave all that money to my dad and I was like, here, you know? And, uh, I think he gave me back like whatever the was left over from the cost of that Breckenridge trip. And I had like 800 bucks to open in my first bank account. You know, and I had enough money to get a plane ticket to the next contest, which was a Grand Prix back in Breckenridge. I went to that contest. I won a thousand bucks, gave it to my dad. He gave me however much. Then the X Games and won uh, 200 bucks. But by the end of that first year competing without any sponsors paying me, I think I won like 13 or 14 grand and I was able to buy a car, buy my first cell phone. And then by that time, there was a little bit of like negotiating room to maybe get some sponsors and stuff. So there's no, you know looking back it's like some of it was luck some of it seemed like good timing you know a lot of it was my parents making that decision to go to mammoth you know what if my dad hadn't ran into don bostic at breck you know or what if scotty didn't plug me in with the rosignol dude you know so there's stuff that i look back on that it's like you know i had and i'm sure that you have this experience too like a lot i had a lot of really like good homies that are fucking phenomenal snowboarders that didn't make it Mm -hmm. you know what i mean 100 percent. like like Funny phenomenal cats and mammoths and i'm like dude this kid is good how is this kid not like put on um and so that's just the you know i don't know sometimes it's just like who you know and who's willing to kind of take a chance and you know invest in you and stuff and you know i'm lucky that i initially had a contest to kind of back my um back my snowboarding and stuff because it it, it then opened up doors for other opportunities from there on. So I'm thinking your dad had ulterior motives to go to Mammoth. 40 ounce killer or swiller wanted to get a rap career going. He was thinking California. He's, yeah, Whoa. Cali yeah. dreaming. It wasn't on. Just Cali it wasn't just. Uh, we just lost some of the dragon you. fruit. Oh, uh, we lost dragon. Lost we got dragon some fruit. We need to cut that or keep it in and put a slow mo on it. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, I want to I want to change gears here and get back to uh, Palmer here because first things first, I got to ask. Were you running the Palmer pads? What are the Palmer pads? Oh, no. no Palmer pads <laughs> elevate your bindings off your board so you yeah. get less toe drag. Not yeah. can't kit. It's, I think it's more pads. of a border cross. I think it's more of a border uh, cross. You want to be like, higher up. Finch was rocking them. Finch was rocking yeah. Palmer pads. Yeah, and it was like kind of one of those things where you're like, should I? Because like he, I don't He's know. Going like, huge. He, Finch always boosted at events. Like it was always like, sometimes it was a little 
wild, but like like him and Abe Teeter, like at these events, and this is this is normal super pipe height too, the fourteen footers or whatever, how to ever tell they were Bo- boosting or eighteen foot, eighteen yep. foot boosting every contest, like rain or snow, whatever. I've seen mm-hmm. Finch. I remember going to the to the European Open and like the you know the announcers like English is like kind of broken a little bit, you know, and it's like family event. And Andy he goes, oh, Andy does like a front Crippler seven, just massive. He's like, oh. Andy Andy fucking Finch, big as shit. <laughs> Kripla 720. Like, <laughs> it was great. Can almost dude. hear that. He yeah. had the spiky blonde hair yeah. popping, dude. He was looking good out there. But like, and he, he was, was rocking the Palmer pads for that? Yeah, yeah. I think he rocked them for a long time. But um, they were, I don't know. I feel like snowboards were going through kind of a weird time in the early 2000s, you know, looking back. Because, you know, I kept some old boards and stuff throughout there, and I'd like pull out one of those things. I'm like, dang, I was riding this thing but yeah some of the first um i wasn't rocking the pads but uh i was on the boards and you know i think you just i just got used to riding them i think when i first got on them it was right in the you know it was during like when i was going up to hood and stuff and some of these like camps that i was going to for like pipe camps for the u.s team i was on the u.s team for one year and you know i just it was definitely an adjustment going from rosie to palmer but um i adjusted and you know, I think you just sort of get comfortable with what you're on. I think I think when you're good enough, it doesn't really matter what kind of board you're on, mm-hmm. you know? Like, you don't, like, know, like, it doesn't really matter, you know? Um, I know people get super, like, especially nowadays, super people get super into, like, the tech. Oh, reverse camber, flying V, you know, regular. I'm just like, dude, like, if you're... If you're sound enough individual on a on a board, like it really doesn't matter. Like you'll adjust to whatever whatever you're on. At least that's my that's even my in the take. pipe. I think so. I mean, my hardest adjustment with pi- with going from a, you know one to the other was going from Burton to K two, and obviously that's you know farther on. But that was a big adjustment for me, getting comfortable on those boards and stuff. But yeah, I feel like when I went from like Palmer to Burton and stuff, you know, like it was a gradual, like, Oh, these are, I like these better and stuff like that. But I feel like before I forget, I have to tell a Palmer story. Um, my first photo shoot with Palmer was in New Jersey at mountain Creek. And it was right after this program event. And it was my first time like doing a shoot or whatever. And like, I was going to meet Palmer too. So like by that time, like Palmer had just been like talking to my agent at the time, Bob Klein. And, um, I hadn't met him yet and stuff, but I was, but I like, obviously like Palmer was, I think goaded, you know, like doing skier cross the X games and like border cross and moto and snowmobile, like super impressive. You know, I always thought like this guy's a machine. Um, so I met him at this dinner. He was with the rep who was also like, I was like, Oh, this dude seems kind of wild, whatever. I don't remember his name, but then, you know, Palmer and, and the rep leave the dinner and then we stay, and then we go back to this, like, hotel, the Legend Hotel in Mountain Creek, which I guess was the former Playboy Mansion back in the day or something like that. And it was, like, this really kind of, like, not, not <laughs> nice establishment. But it was, like, it was like the hotel in Mountain Creek at the time. So we stay there. I go up, kind of go into my room, and, and uh, you know, it, it kind of, like, almost reminded me of The Shining a little bit. Like, Palmer, like, I'm coming down the hallway. Palmer comes out of the hallway. He's naked. And he's like, and I like just met this dude an hour before. And he's like, Mace. And then I was like, wait, what? And he just charges me and like picks me up and like body slams me naked on the, not like in an abusive way. Like I think it was in a playful way, you know, but it was definitely like, I'm like, whoa, like what just happened? You know what I mean? Like what's going on? So then, uh, the, the, one of the teeter brothers, Eamon was the team manager. And he was like, he like, came, he's like, Hey man, like really sorry. Like Palmer took some mushrooms after dinner. Like, <laughs> you know, I think like, you know, so that's that like, dude, really sorry. Obviously like not the introduction that we wanted to give you on the team. Like, cause I think that maybe he was like a little, cause at the time, like my dad was still coming to some contests, making sure I was all good. I was on this trip, you know, alone with just like the team and so I think that he was maybe worried that, you know, something was going to get back to Bob or get back to my dad and stuff. And How like, old were you? I was 15. Ooh. Yeah, so that was like my first year still the like naked doing... Man. Getting naked, a, naked, yeah. naked man. Naked man. Naked Paul yeah. body slam yeah. at age 15? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What a legendary yeah. story. Just and like it got... And then like... Introduction you know. to the team here. <laughs> and so I don't know. He was just maybe on a weird one and I've done, I've done mushrooms, you know, but I never like, you know... <laughs> 
I mean, there was like a bunch of Budweiser bottles broken on the bathroom floor in his room and he ripped off a thing on the wall. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to torch Palmer here, but it was a funny story. And like the next day he like came and found me. He was like, Hey man, you know, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, really glad to have you here. Love that you're on the team. Like whatever. I was like, no man, it's cool. It's totally cool. Cause I'm just like trying to not, you know, I'm just trying, I'm like, it's chill. It's yeah. chill. Body slam me naked. Yeah. It's fine, all dude. Good. It's all good. I'm just stoked to be here. <laughs> but yeah. So, I mean, it was it was a good time. <laughs> all right. We're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about Union Bindings. Their 2223 line is available at uh, unionbindingcompany.com. Now, I want to talk about their team because it's stacked. Stacked. Buds. Let's run through some names. we got Jess Kimura, mm. Travis Rice, mm. a.k.a. T. Ricky, Kevin Backstrom, Gigi Ruff, Arthur Longo, Beast. Kazu, Scott Stevens, Brian Noguchi, Mike Rav, Torstein, Jamie Anderson. Wow. They got Forrest Shearer out there running the uh, splitboard binding, splitboard god out there. Austin Viz, Benny Milam. Whoa, there's my name. Chris Craig. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mm. I don't know about wait, that. Wait, that's that's, that's a, actually that, that a typo. I think it's a typo. I think wow. that's a typo. <laughs> but re- regardless, uh, if you're thinking about picking up bindings. Is there an Eastone on there by chance? I ride those bindings. I have, it's a big team. It's stacked, dude. It's, but no Eastone, huh? Yeah, I don't hmm. know. I'll have to scroll through. Ah. Maybe it's a glitch. Hmm. You know? So, yeah, if you're, if you're interested in picking up some bindings, obviously Union makes the best bindings. I run the Forces, and then I run the Explorers when I'm out there pounding granola doing some sp- split boarding out there. Uh, or, as we like to call it, granola blading. So, um, nice. yeah, uh, head on over to Union Bindings website and check them out. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about the style experience, buds. Canada Snowboard is revolutionizing the big air game with their newest event, the Style Experience, with an integrated style contest component that is the perfect combination of progressive and timeless tricks, Chris. Yep, that one is going to keep the revs high, buds. Watch the best snowboarders in the world chuck carcass at the largest big air contest Canada has ever seen in the winter stronghold of Edmonton, Alberta. It's going down in the Commonwealth Stadium, boasting VIP suite options, private bars, heated tents, a vendor village, and more. Fire this one up on the evening of December 10th, Canada. The style experience is made possible through the partnership between Canada Snowboard and Explore Edmonton, presented by Toyota. Get on your most stylish winter gear and secure a spot at the winter event of the year on Ticketmaster. All right, we're going to get into a guest question from none other than... Lane Kanak. Here we go. What is happening, fellas? Lane Kanak calling in with a question for Mason Aguirre. Mace, cannot wait to hear this. Hyped to hear you're in the booth. Start this question off with more of a statement. You guys, we were all younger, watching y'all shred. You, the whole Friends crew, you guys were the original, in my eyes at least, the group of ATV machines just shredding everything all the time. Didn't seem like there was much you guys weren't really good at riding on. What made you go and focus mainly on half pipe? What was behind that decision? Why not everything? I know you dabbled some in filming and did some slope contests, but what made you go more in the direction of half pipe? Cannot wait to hear this episode. Really hyped to see you doing well these days. Love and miss you. Later, guys. Nice. Yeah, Lane, big inspiration big time um it's a good question um i think that kind of as i mentioned early on like the doors that opened early on were through half pipe contest um so that's kind of i guess that's kind of the route that i sort of went you know um i think it was it's like a double-edged sword it's like you know, I think that I was I was spending as much time riding pipe as I was um, jumping and hitting rails even, like more, not street rails, but like in the park and stuff because I was really wanting to get better at my slope style riding because a lot of the guys I looked up to were slope style riders. And back then, like you had dudes that were riding pipe and then doing the slope contest too. You know, a lot of guys were like Chaz and um, Pat Moore, you know, Scotty, myself, Danny. Kevin, like, you know, a lot of us were doing, we go to Vans Cup or do tour and it'd be like pipe, then it'd be slope, whatever. 
but it seemed like, you know, I was stacking better results in pipe when the Olympics conversation came up, you know, that was a thing, you know, with my team managers and people at Burton, whether like, is this something you want to pursue? You know, we're behind you either way. Um, it seemed like that's where I was, uh, you know, it seemed like even though at the time I was sort of a long shot to like make the team, it was something that I wanted to try to do. And then that happened. Um, but on the other side of it, I think once that, once I was maybe labeled like a pipe rider or that's how people knew me, it was hard to move away from that because I, w I was seeing some of the older guys that were exclusively pipe riders that once they weren't doing as well in pipe contests, they were gone. Maybe not cut from their sponsors, but just like they just like disappeared, you know? So I wanted to try to film more and shoot more photos and do that kind of stuff because you know I felt like I, I didn't have like a pipe rider style like I and I knew I knew from like early shoot days with Blotto and Zacher and Curtis and some of these guys of like how to shoot a good photo like a back 180 or front three looks way better than doing like a back nine you know and stuff you know like I learned a lot of that from like Ryan Luger and Colin Langlois and people that would like we go to shoot Tim Eddie, you know what I mean? Like Mitch Reed, people that were like they do super stylish shit and they'd be like hitting covers and stuff off of like pretty basic maneuvers, you know. So it was, um, you know, I wouldn't change anything, you know. Um, there was, you know, I wish some, you know, I had a opportunity to film a standard my part got cut to the credit or to the bonus you know so i mean it's it's you know filming is like not to be overlooked it's very hard to get shots it's very hard to get in a movie i definitely am grateful that i had those experiences to like respect like the dudes like yourself that were filming parts all year it was really hard to to um compete half the season then totally shift and like go ride a snowmobile out in the backcountry in colorado and like stack clips so i don't know I feel like I'm I'm cool with how I was uh I don't really think that it was a decision to okay, I'm just gonna focus on pipe. I just think that where that's what that's where I was from, you know, two thousand three until two thousand ten, that's where I was stacking most of my results, like my good results anyway. So as an observation, I mean, as a kid you were stacking cheddar biscuits in the pipe. Why mm -hmm. would you why would you go anywhere else? Yeah. I mean it was makes uh, sense. Yeah, man. yeah. And you know, Prize money and incentives was like a great, you know, motivator for contests for sure. You ain't getting a bonus of ten yeah. stacks when you front board two seventy yeah. the hand What's up yeah. with that? And when you when <laughs> you land, there's no there's no uh, check coming in the mail. Yeah. yeah, I think too, like like, uh, and this is like a great thing about living in Mammoth and stuff is that like, just riding one thing gets boring, you know. And I think too, like regardless of how people. Um, if they like thought of my name, oh yeah, Mason, great pipe rider, whatever. The guys that I looked up to, like Lane and like Danny and Kyle Clancy, like these guys were all very good pipe riders that also did other things. Well, I was going back and watching your old contest runs, and it was cool because I was also thinking about the climate of the half pipe contest back then. And you were really on the forefront of the stylish new generation in the half pipe, where you have obviously Danny Cass was holding the torch of making 1080s look good because a lot of the guys before it's maybe kind of like the hot hands, like you kind of mm -hmm. you give it a grab and you then you unwind, it. you slap mm -hmm. it and you unwind, and and you have all these guys maybe they're going huge and they're doing big tricks, but they hadn't refined the tweaks and the grabs and this and they didn't look they didn't look great doing them they were they were just they were innovating these new tricks and they just hadn't refined them yet which is totally awesome but you guys you and danny you know danny cast danny davis you guys were coming through and making 1080s look good and holding the grab and um i feel like that's where your guys's success came from is taking half pipe and making it look good in my opinion thank you um it's funny, like, where the level is now in half-pipe riding. <laughs> like, back then, like, we were getting paid pretty well to do 1080s and shit, which is <laughs> rad. But, um, yeah, I think that um, Danny was definitely cast, was definitely one to make that shit look, like, really smooth. He didn't ever, like, go. It was weird because we, a lot of, I've competed a lot of contests with Danny. Like, he would always be, like, super, like, the first two days of practice, like, going, like, two feet out, like, whatever. I'm like, what is fucking Danny doing, dude? You know? And then pipe run time, boosting. Like, it was always, like, whoa. It was like that at the Olympics. He was we had, like, it, huh? Yeah. 
I mean, we had like six or seven or eight days of practice at the Olympics because our event was like way later. And Danny was just kind of like riding, like whatever. Ended up just like going off. Obviously got a silver medal. But he was a good he was a good person to watch that was making stuff look good. Um, then like when Danny Davis started traveling with us, he was like a little wild in the beginning, but he started to like really pu- pull his shit together. Scotty was also like really charging it. Um, Kevin ended up getting it together a little later on, but, um, yeah, I guess I never really thought of that, you know what I mean? Other than like, I was trying, like, I knew like what my strengths were and trying to refine that. And it's just crazy to see like where the progression has gone, you know, like with half pipe riding, never really like, I guess back then, like. We were, like, we were like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go do, like, a 1440, sure, you know? Like, we'd make fun of that, you know? Like, it was never going to happen, you know? Um, what about the kid going just boost Richter style in the Olympics? You ever think people would nutty. be that big? Absolutely <laughs> insane. Yeah, it was super impressive to watch, for sure. So, going back, you are you got on Burton. We didn't really talk about the process getting on, but you're dominating contests at this point. You're, this is when you're really uh, flowing like the Nile, we'll say. And uh, we gotta talk. We gotta talk cheddar biscuits here. Like the kid was, the kid was making some bread. The kid was like Scrooge McDuck. What do we give us some numbers? Give us something to chew on here. I think the first Burton contract that I got. It was funny because that year at the U.S. Open that I was on Palmer. Like it was, it was weird how the season kind of evolved. I was like riding like Mission Six gear, and then I was riding some other like I don't even know outerwear who I was getting it from. But by the end of that year at the Open. I was wearing head to toe Burton except my snowboard. <laughs> Everything else was Burton. So they were kind of like, I wasn't breaching contract, but like I would started to talk to like Dave Driscoll and Chaka and some of these team managers and they would be like, yeah, come, you know, like we have some gear if you want it. And like, you know, very much like the, the gear was really comfortable. It was really good quality. I was super happy with it, but, um, yeah, so I had a really good showing at the Open. It was jam format that, that year. I got fourth, and it was like, you know, the Open, in my opinion, is bigger than the Olympics, bigger than X Games. Like, I mean, that's a very coveted, or was a very coveted event. I always wanted to win the Open. never happened, but came close a few times. But um, so, and obviously, like, at the Open, everyone from Burton is there. So I feel like that opened up the conversation for real, for real with them. And, uh, yeah, by that June, I was on, and... <clears throat> I think my first contract was like, I think I was running like a 30 K salary and like a 25 K travel budge. So, I mean, to go from eight grand, you know, on Palmer to that, like it seemed like a real, and at 16, 16, I was like, that's all right. Some, no, when you're 16, that's, so, that's cheddar. So yeah, for sure. Biscuits. By this point, it's like, okay, I'm like, this is happening. I was winning some prize money too. So, I mean, I don't remember exactly how it, but, um, yeah, by I think, and I, I think that was a one year deal to try to just see is either one or two years, and then when we when we renegotiated that next year, that's when the big bucks came in for sure. I think like that year before the Olympics, I think I was like around in total with all my sponsors, probably somewhere between the three fifty to four hundred range. Woo-wee. You know, damn. So honestly, I remember like I wasn't like because like I, back then like I wasn't spending my money on shit either. You know, like I think like when I was seventeen, I bought a new car, the cash that was like my first big purchase. Um, but I remember like going to do my taxes with like the, whatever, like CPA guy and like seeing my tax return. And I was like, I was like, I made that much. Holy shit. <laughs> cause I think like you don't take into account the contest, the bonuses and photo incentives. Cause like, that was another thing too. Like you would get photo incentives, thousand bucks for a half page, whatever, all this. And then, and then the really cool thing that happened when I got on Burton, um, like a year or two into it was they brought me on to help design the custom with mods, Johnson and Heike Sorsa. And they gave us royalties on it. So I was making two bucks a board on every custom that was sold. They're moving so I get, I get a, like I was getting royal, seller, right? Yeah. And and on top of the salary and everything like that, like once a, once a quarter, I'd get a royalty check. So if it was like in the winter, like that first quarter or second quarter, I, I remember my first royalty check was like 60K yeah. off the custom. And that was just and a that, quarter. And that was really just like, I mean, we were. Yes, that's the sales season. I would say for the majority of the, the graphic or whoever the team was that was driving like the how the board was going to look, whatever. I mean, yeah, we gave some input and got to add a few like personal touches to like our size. Like Heike was running the 58, Mods was running the 60, and I was on the 56 and got to do a couple cool little things. It wasn't a pro model and our names weren't on it, but we had it like on one of the boards, like I had an outline in Minnesota on like the 
06 custom that was kind of behind the graphic. So like that was my little thing. So that was a great opportunity. I thought that was cool, you know, to be a part of that. It felt good to be a part of something for well, sure. That check must have felt pretty good. Yeah, too, right? for sure. And I guess you just like, I don't like looking back, like, you know how long it takes me to make 60K now? Yeah. So it's like, yeah. Just sitting in yeah, a room yeah, and yeah, sure. throwing a colorway down. <clears throat> yeah. So um, it definitely like came really fast and life changed probably, you know, from 15 to 18, it was a dramatic change you know and then you know the energy drinks companies and stuff mm-hmm. like came into the mix and, and stuff pizza like rolls yeah totinos and oh. shit like that i mean my first when i actually i've i've i had around 18 like had to switch agents and that was a really tough conversation to have you know and i really you know admired bob klein he was a pro snowboarder in the 80s whatever and uh, was representing Clancy and DK and, like, Tom Gillis and Andy Finch. And, you know, he had a pretty stuff. Like, I was like, this guy's representing some cool riders that I that I fuck with for sure. But I had an opportunity to sign with Wasserman. And, you know, it was, like, kind of weird. Like, I don't know if, like, fire is the right word. But, you know, going in a different direction, whatever. But um, that first, like, opportunity that Wasserman gave me was autograph signing at the X Games for, like, Gillette Razors. And my agent, Steve Ruff, was like, yeah, dude, it's, um, it's like, an it's an hour. I don't know. I'm like, dude, I don't even have facial hair. Like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> I, I like, he's like, no, no, no. You just, like, have to go to the tent, sign some shit for an hour, it pays 10 grand. And I was like, what? Like, he's like, yeah, for an hour, it's just 10K. And I'm just like, okay, <laughs> sure, dude. So it's just weird. Like, I guess maybe I felt, like, undeserving in a sense, you know, like it was imposter syndrome. Yeah. Like a little bit. Um, but nonetheless, it was very cool. So, I mean, once, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff would happen from time to time and it was really tight, you know, if it was like kind of no strings attached, if it was just like a one-time thing, you know? So that was, that was pretty fire. I've got a Patreon question for you. Um, first we want to thank our Patreon members and anyone who's curious about it. There's a link on our website, but, uh, it's our family. You can get involved. You get to ask our, Guess a question. You get some bomb hole swag. You get to um, support the show. Yeah, Thank support the show. Keep the lights on. Keep us uh, allowing us to be dipshits in the booth. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you guys are our family, though. Thank you to the Patreon members. This is from uh, Nick F. He wants to know about the unreleased version of the Totino's pizza commercial. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was... Uh... I don't know, dude. Jack comes up with these stupid freaking ideas to film shit and stuff. And He's an idea man, huh? Jack? Yeah, I always not. I, never, I don't really feel like I was really ever like the star of any of the Friends Vision skits or whatever, which like I don't really care. It was just fun to be like a part, you know, it was just fun to be like around those guys, you know what I mean? But yeah, we had this uh, part of our contract with Totino's, with Totino's was to film a couple commercials and stuff. And, you know, we did it, um, me and Danny, like we filmed one in Tahoe. I don't know where you filmed another one, but easy payday, like stick around the helmet for the year, film a couple commercials. I think my, my first year with Totino's was like 50 K like, you know, and I'm just like, I'd be stupid not to do this, you know? And, and like, you know, we go to these contests and we'd get like dry ice, like chess full of Totinos, like way too much too. It'd be like three hundred. And we're at we're in Breck, or we're in Park City for five days. We're like, dude, who's gonna eat all these? <laughs> um, but yeah, Danny filmed this uh, uh, <laughs> film this commercial where he uh, gets out of bed and uses a sweet potato as a dick, and then like was like scratching it in between his whatever in between his shit, and I don't know. I had some weird like goggle lens like super high up on my face, and I don't know. It, it just. <laughs> I guess you could go to the you could look it up on on YouTube. Oh, it's on there. YouTube. Yeah, an yeah, unreleased yeah. commercial. Yeah, no, it's on there. Yeah, it's it's like it's. I don't really know what it's titled under. You're on but Totino's yeah. team. Sorry, Me and Mason are on the Totino's team. We know what's crispy and what's not. Sorry, I'm not Danny Dave. Are we on? All right, thanks a lot, Jim. What does pro snowboarder Dan Davis dream about? <laughs> Now we are rolling. Dan! <laughs>
Those are my rules. Stop whining. They're free. It's it's funny how like there's actually a lot of people that like will reference that to me. <clears throat> like weird stuff that I never thought would like people would pay attention to. They're like, oh dude, the Totino's commercial that you guys did. <laughs> fucking legendary. And I'm like I was like, I thought like, oh, this is fucking stupid, but like it's kind of funny. You know yeah. what I mean? But yeah, I, I do get caught. Well, Totino going. sponsored friends or you all had individual contracts? No, or? it was just me and Danny. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It was just me and Danny. Maybe there was someone else, but n- not in the crew. Yeah, no, it was just me and Danny. Dude, that's just a great ham- sponsor. Hammer and yeah. pizza rolls, chucking. Yeah. Yeah. In the half. Bike. And the cool yeah. thing was is that I had this coupe, like they sent us like these stack of coupons that were like good for Totinos at any grocery store in the United States. So I could take like one of these coupons to like whatever, you know, like any Safeway or, you know, Angles, whatever, Publix. And, you know, it didn't matter the grocery store. I could go get Totinos. So, yeah. Give them out a, to the homies yeah, too really, and the family. It was really encompassing the snowboarders diet for sure. Did you were, I mean, that's just heyday of snowboarders yeah. making money when pizza rolls are paying more yeah. than kids make today. Like good pros are making less than fifty k. Yeah, making up to probably five hundred in the heyday, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's that was like more or less like kind of around where I was at, you know. But I think that too, like you know, start making more money, start spending it, start buying shit. More you know? money, more problems. Like, for real, you know. I definitely was the least smart with my money out of anyone I know, <laughs> for sure. What was you know? the uh, most what are we frivolous BMFing buy? On? What are we BMFing? Yeah, what's like the craziest, most expensive, frivolous buy you made um, out there? I think that it was like a combination of. Uh, it seemed like I. It seemed like I was good for getting a new car about every couple of years. Nice, you know. So, um, I got super into driving Audis and BMWs and stuff. I wasn't buying them cash or anything like that, but like you know, I, I, you know, why would I have another car when I have a Tundra that's totally paid off? You know yeah. what I mean? Like I replay the kind of this, my justification from back then and how I would justify buying these things or whatever. And like at one point I think I had like three cars when I was living in San Diego and it was like, there was no real rhyme or reason as to why I did, you know, like I, I bought a, I bought a BMW M3 just to drive up the hood for the summer. That was, it was like a 98, but like, I was like, this will be a fun car to go up to snowboard camp with for the summer. I had it for a year, sold it. Like, just stupid shit like that was, you know, and I think just, oh, Vegas this weekend for sure. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff, you know? So it was always like, you know, some YOLO type shit for sure. And I'm sure you went to Vegas as a baller when you're making 500K. I mean, you know, there's some debauchery that comes with being in that city and, you know, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I like to gamble and do things back then. And I wouldn't say like I lot, I don't want to say like my downfall was gambling by any yeah. means. I think that like, if I if I was losing more than like a G bone in Vegas, I was feeling pretty bad about myself. Oh, okay. So like I wasn't going and spending ten racks in Vegas and stuff. There's people but, that make hardly any money that'll yeah. lose a G bone in Vegas. There, there was even a time. Twice. There was a time when I was kind of coming towards the end of my career, and for years, um, I had my mom on payroll, kind of as like my assistant. She was taking care of like bills, quarterly taxes, stuff like that. And she kind of ran the money, you know what I mean? Which was really helpful because I like at the time when I was like really snowboarding it was like i was gone like 10 months out of the year so i'd like you know when i would come back to san diego or like go to mammoth and stay in my condo or whatever i'd be home for like two days you know, I'd go out two days come back two days so it's like these things it was it was kind of two sides to it it's like looking back i wish that i'd learned how to balance a budget on my own and you know make these tax payments and look at my <clears throat> debt to income ratio just shit like that you know learn how to like use uh you know credit utilization you know shit that i didn't learn until like a couple of years ago you know <laughs> i feel like you were yeah, too young real. to really learn mm-hmm. you never you didn't live that normal life yeah. where you're paying bills and Mm-mm. and just learning the basics you just were young and yeah. got handed a bunch of money and i hit my mom hit know me what up to do. One, my mom hit me up one month and she said honey i just want to let you know that you spent 32 grand last month and um you know, it's a little bit more than I'd like to see. So maybe just keep an eye on that. I think that, you know, like my mom and other people that were close to me kind of saw like is my life sort of unravel a little bit, but were maybe a little bit like cautious about not wanting to push me away or maybe how I would react. Yeah. What you if know you flipped I mean? out and took her job away? You know? Or like, <laughs> 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 I mean, I trust me. I was very grateful for the help. My mom also like, she is a kitchen and bath designer. She had a full time job, you know, uh, she was working. So, so she, she was, was just helping you. Yeah. She was just helping me. She probably could have charged me a lot more for the, the headaches and stuff like that. But, um, yeah. So like, that's, you know, that's a just fucking absurd, that amount of money to spend in a month. I can't even like, it makes me sick, but like, so I did what, it, you what know? is your, uh, <laughs> advice for a young kid that might stumble into $500,000 a year? Man, I, I mean, 
I think that, you know, having, um, you know, having someone that, you know, has your best interest financially and someone that's able to kind of, you know, intervene on spending habits or, you know, I guess just like the ramifications that come in, like I didn't deal with the consequences of my financial decisions till much later, you know what I mean? And like, I got fucking hit bad. So, um, we'll get into it, but, yeah. um, well, let's get into that in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you should have like yeah, got think, some gold bars and buried yeah. them in the backyard. And I had, for, you know, like I, I was putting day. money into retirement. I was doing stuff like that. You know, yeah. that's all gone now. But, um, you know, at the time I was like trying to be smart and putting away stuff and, you know, um, doing all that. But, um, and you know, my parents were definitely wanting me to, you know, I bought a condo in like Oh five and Mammoth. So, I mean, I was trying to invest in real estate and before the market crash in Oh eight, like everyone was like, real estate's a great investment. Like this is what you like absolutely need to buy into, you know? So I essentially bought it the worst time. And, um, you couldn't hold on to it. And it, not sell it? I was about to be upside down in it by like 2011. So ah. yeah, so it was basically like if I had rented it, I wouldn't have been able to cover like my mortgage. It was, a, you know, I didn't lose the house, but I kind of had to pile some cash together to get out without having to like short sale and things like that. But um, so yeah, so we were trying to make those right investments, like doing real estate and investing in that way and 401k and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there's so much good uh, free game out there nowadays, there man. Is, like it's, it's so rad. Much. And like, I've learned a lot, you know what I mean? Like the, the CPA, my CPA, Wendy, that runs my business, she's amazing. She, she's, she's yeah, give her air horn. <laughs> she's, um, give her she's helped horn. me a lot. Just like learning about, about stuff. And, um, that sounds very vague learning about stuff, but you know, <laughs> there's a lot that comes with, you know, having a business to, you know, running, financials and what that looks like and so i've just tried to be more of like a sponge and like appreciate that like the people that do this shit for a living like to help people like me that don't know as much so all right let's get back into to snowboarding because we still got we still got a lot to cover and we're we're an hour in so let's keep things moving here and i really want to get into a really fun wormhole we're going to queue up from none other than our boy danny davis here we go Okay, this question. Mason Aguirre, Dan Davis here. How are you? Stoked to listen to this bomb hole. Uh, my question for you is, you were one of my big idols. The gear you wore, like you had you know, big baggy pants. You always wore some wild kits. But the one thing that always blew my mind was your goggle sag. And I just want to know <laughs> for the kids out there, how, how much sag is too much sag and what's not enough? Um, if, if someone's got a big nose, do they need to like maybe get some sort of reconstructive surgery to get their nose <laughs> to allow for goggle sag? We just, we just need an update on, on where the goggle sag came from and what's too much and what's not enough. Thanks, Mace. Another idiotic question by another. I need to know exactly member, what goggle sure. sag is. I think where I first saw it for real was Heike Sorsa in the Olympics, man. We're talking like, like rocking the, the mohawk and shit, the Oakley, the pink Oakleys with the studs oh, in them. Oh, so the, that's the so sag. The, so it's so, in so the no, a, nor, a normal goggle sits like this. A, a goggle sag, you're going to want to go like the band all the way to the bottom. Like basically, yeah, you're, you're top right. your eyelids. How do you even keep it yep. on? That's how you. That, that looks about right. That, I don't think I was that far. How do you, <laughs> you, were somewhere how do you like keep this. it on? I we think could probably looking. find a Oh, photo. it goes low on the nose. Yeah, this like is what that. you want to be looking like. Wow. Um, I don't really know where I saw it. Uh, and how do you do that without a gaper gap? You got to keep the beanie low. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, a lot goes well, in well, there. Well, do the ladder. Like, do up too high. I want to so, see up too high. Yeah, let's see up too high. Let's so go up too. High, let's go. Like, let's this go. This is a bit of a tough. One. Who runs up let's too high? Let's go up high, dude. Let's go like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so up too high. Yeah, All right. That's a tough so one. I guess finding the happy medium. I guess it started to kind of chill out later on, you know. But I think early on, like, yeah, you see. I mean, everyone's got their like. I would say, like, no one was reinventing the wheel, man. Like, I saw Heike Sorcerer running those goggles, those Oakley goggles with the studs in them. You best believe my ass was at Hot Topic getting studs and putting them getting in my studs. Oakleys the next year for sure. And, like, I ran that for, like, a year and a half. Like, even though, like, that's when I had the distressed, like, weird kit that I was talking about earlier. Like, I was rocking the studs in the goggles. Dude, <laughs> I feel lost. If, if I like, was one yeah. of you Burton yeah. boys making all that money, I'd have, like, bands stacked in the... Mm, that's a good idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just all the way around. Like, I had no idea when I see you guys that you're making that kind of cheddar. You should have, like, we, shown that to the world. We also, going on uh, back on the East Coast... We were very. We picked up on the goggle sag as a huge because mm. because we're living on the east. Did you try it? And oh yeah, we would we would drop them down. But it came from I think the epicenter of goggle sag was mammoth. And I actually put together 
a goggle sag Hall of Fame list. Wow. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. I love so that. I mean, obviously, obviously, Mason's on there. Yeah. Uh, Mason's wow. uh, definitely an title. inductee to the uh, goggle Appreciate sag Hall that. of Fame. <laughs> it's been but, a while since I've gotten an award of yeah. any kind. I'll yep. take it. Wow. So we got uh, obviously John Jackson and Matt yeah. Hammer. That's oh, a great. I remember Matt they used Hammer. to run them yeah. really low. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, JP Solberg. He had those things dropped down. Larry. Laurie, how you oh, say? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're yeah. right now. It's a little sure. like you couldn't see his nose. Yeah, no, he definitely. And he had like the weird, like, kind of like big beanie, too. Yeah. yeah. Like the hair coming out. Big like, Rasta beanie like, or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And then we had obviously Mason and Danny Davis were running him low. Um, and then, you know, this is a low key one, but I remember Bradshaw had him, had him drop down pretty low. The as mayor. Well. Yeah, bear. <laughs> so a lot of California-based snowboarders kept him sag. They were kind of on the forefront of the goggle sag. This is the Cali. Thing, a lot huh? of dragons were really dropped down. Yeah, they too. were for sure. Yeah, yeah I think. Is there they, any think current that... riders rocking that? I haven't seen it as much. We need to get I mean, somebody out. I there. guess I'm not a as lot of the kids in don't even wear goggles. Oh, true. Nowadays. People don't even wear goggles. Street kids, they're like riding the mountain. No, yeah, goggles. they go to the mountain. No goggles. Pretty soon, their eyes are going to be like just popping out of their for head because sure. the wind. For sure, like Steve Buscemi and Mr. Deeds. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're going to be like. He's like, story. hey, you know. Dude, I heard a story. <laughs> a good reference. call out right there. Was there was a pro skier that didn't wear goggles ever. And now in his old age, his eyes are all messed up and they're sticking out. Like He's like Buscemi. Steve Buscemi. Yeah. 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 Just like that. So that's a real vibe. thing. Yeah, no, kids better be yeah, careful. What they call Buscemi syndrome. Yeah, you don't want to get Buscemi syndrome. <laughs> you do not want to get that. It's Absolutely. serious, man. You're, you're messed up. So, oh also, you know, we talked goggle sag. Obviously, we'll get you an inductee uh, plaque for the goggle yeah, sag hall of fame. That, We'd so. almost make a little plaque that has all the members on it. <laughs> yeah, hang, hang it up for and sure. Go. Yeah. Get that done. So, and I would like to hear like John and like Hammer's take on it too. Yeah, like, where like they got it. You know, get I probably it. took it from them or whatever. I mean, we, you I want to know who started this thing. Yeah. Hammer's got to be on the. I mean, the hammer. first person that I saw goggles run or a helmet run over the goggles, like without the strap outside, was Pat Moore, at at nationals in like Waterville. Like it was like a long time ago, you know. Or that maybe was it was deep. Mammoth. Maybe it was Mammoth when he was a uh, young blood on forum. But young I remember bloods. seeing that, and I was like, that looks like a way more comfortable way to like rock the helmet. And then I'd like I'd bailed on my Burton helmet, and, like got a Pro Tech, and started running underneath. You know what I mean? Because I saw Pat do it, so like it definitely wasn't something. That was another thing that I did that I just like saw someone else doing. It looked cool to me. You know what I mean? Maybe other people said, oh, that looks fucking stupid." But to me, it looked cool, looked more comfortable, and I and I like really respected Pat. So I was like, "That's tight," you know. And now, and Dan uh, touched on briefly is your kits, right? I remember seeing you. I think. When I was in high school, U.S. Open, it was the year Travis won the Rail Jam, Travis Rice. So I don't know what year that was. Wow, Probably like year. 04 or some sh- Or no, 05 or 04 or something like that. Anyway, I saw you there, and I remember you were running the one-piece, I think, plaid maybe? I'm not Probably, sure. Probably, yeah. But you'd run like the yeah. matching kits. Like you were kind of getting a little ignorant yeah. with the kits out there. I feel like the, it was like the ugliest like one-piece shit that Burton had. I was like, I want it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Give it to like, me. <laughs> yeah, like they had the snake skin that came out, and I was like, "Yeah, run that," you know what I mean? And like, actually, and then I had like the yellow, like cartel or the or- the green cartel bindings to go with it, and like I got like a- I actually got a couple of sick photos like in that kit and like stuff. But it's but definitely some of the kits are so cringy, dude. Like it's looking back like so over. It's crazy how it's sort of how it's evolved and changed. And back then, like it was uh, the the Burton pants were so big. But the jackets, like the XL jacket that went with the large pant or XL pant was like kind of short and boxy. And so it was like the kit didn't like match up with the length. And I remember like trying to fight to get longer, some longer jackets. And you had some taller guys. Like you had Colin, you had Ryan Luger. You know, I was like, I'm not like the tallest, but like a weird build. So it looked weird. Um, But yeah, definitely had some like really ugly kits. um, But like. But then, like, you'd see them on the mountain, like, the next year, you know what I mean? Like, not saying that it was because of me, but, I mean, yeah, usually, I think that all started was, like, my my second X Games, I didn't have a, I was on Palmer, but I had, like, and I had Smith, but I had, like, no other sponsors. I think I had Dekine and uh, no outerwear sponsor, and I was going from Breck to... Um, going from Breck to X Games with my dad and we stopped by like some ski shop that was in Frisco and they had this like just super ugly lime green one piece ski suit that was like 30 bucks and I was like I want to wear this at X Games you know what I mean and so we bought it and I took like a studded belt and like wrapped it around the butt and like (laughs) ran that and like I don't know I was still like not I wouldn't say like really well known then but um 
my dad's like, no, because then you make a statement like people are going to know that like you don't have an outerwear sponsor because you have this absurd ski suit. Like it's a great idea. <laughs> it's like kind of smart. Yeah, and I think that there's, I think that there's, I have a photo on my laptop of it or something. It's just like, Love man, those that. are the days, you know, <laughs> for sure. Well, I, you mentioned your stature briefly. You mentioned your stature, and uh, I was doing some research yesterday, stature. getting ready. Um, and uh, on the week on your Wikipedia, there was an interesting oh thing I had to pull out that I oh thought God. was hilarious. Another thing that sets him apart from the field is his unusual stature. <laughs> he is a lanky five eleven, weighing only one hundred and fifty pounds. However, he has shown no signs of this affecting his mid air maneuvers. Six one now, baby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Stature. You no, know, that was pre puberty, dog. Um, <laughs> that, that's who wrote your that? Wikipedia? I don't know who writes Wikipedia. I don't know. Pages, but I, I don't know. Was, I think anyone weird. can write and submit. Isn't that how those work? He's yeah. like Mason's. Like I wrote that shit. I got a copy of your job resume out into the market, and uh, on it was inducted into the Goggle Sag Hall of Fame, <laughs> as well as beat Sean White in the halfpipe. Yeah, it that's happened a, a few times. I That's think heavy. I think I feel like you yeah. can get a job anywhere with that. Yep, but that right at the top. I, of the I would resume. hire you. Yeah, if I saw that. Uh, I I think that since then there's been a lot taller dudes than me that have kind of come. I, I just think it's like it, maybe it's a weird. I guess at the time there was a lot of shorter guys. Abe Teeter was like six six. He's a big guy. Yeah, got Louis. Uh, Vito. And then since then you had like Sebed, DeBuck, and you know some dudes that are like I'm like yeah tall men. You know like killing it. You know. I don't know if guys. there's a yeah I don't and I don't know if there's an advantage being lower center of gravity and being a smaller dude like I honestly like I'm a big I was always a big proponent of like snowboarding being 25 percent physical 75 percent mental like for me like personally I felt like here I am at a contest there's dudes of all different sizes you know if I was playing like one on one basketball with one of these dudes like who would have the advantage you know if I'm like going against someone that's five foot or something. Probably the taller guy. Maybe not. I mean, you got your, you know, short NBA players. Bugsy the, Bugs. Yeah, Robinson, Earl Boykins, you know, some of those dudes. But Who's like, that one dude who's super short? He can jump wicked. <clears throat> Bugsy Bugs? That's him. Probably. But um, I think it's just how your body's built. Because you look at Rob Rother, who's, what, six five? Yeah, he's a tall dude. But he's six, built, six. like, such an athlete that I think size doesn't matter. And Louis Vito is also, like, super short, chucking... Dubs yeah. all over. I yeah. think you've seen more guys like like especially pipe riders move into more athletes now than it used to be. Yeah, Scotty James. Like, is I used to get high up. and go compete in contests. You know what I mean? So it's like now, like I doubt you can see I used to rip dirts at the top of X Games, like trying to calm the nerves, you know? Like that would be probably not chill. I, I want to know, actually, I love this <laughs> conversation because you've competed at all these high level competitions and it's just like the crowd's there, you're it's on TV, there's all this pressure from sponsors and you got two runs to put it down did you have a pre-run routine how did you get your mind right i think it was uh a lot of times it was like um it's not like a vert contest where you go and it's like the same vert ramp being built you know like conditions are always like affected sometimes like you don't have the same Dude cutting the pipe, you know, I would love, you know, to have, you know, Frank Wells cut every single pipe that I ever rode, but it just wasn't that way, you know. Um, you definitely knew when it's like, oh, Frank's here, he's cutting it. You're like, oh, it's going to be really good. Um, and then you're just kind of feeling out. Sometimes one, some are a little, some are a little longer, sometimes they're a little shorter. So I think eventually it would be like, all right, I'm going to do this if I have to do, you know, I'm going to do this running qualifiers to try to like play it safe, put one down, and then I'm going to go ham. You know, next one, maybe if I land in my first qualifier run, I was for sure going to make it, like, bust out a kind of finals run, like, in the qualifier to see, like, how I could deal with it, you know, if I could put it down. But definitely, like, adding the element of the pressure and stuff like that. I mean, I learned to feed off it. You know, I struggled with it in the beginning. You know, I struggled with it. I had a hard time keeping it together emotionally. Um, you know, I remember a contest that like, I was like, I don't know, I threw my helmet in the crowd or something like that. And my dad's like, dude, I'll take snowboarding away. Like you still live under my roof. Like, don't come out here and act like, you know what I mean? Overprivileged fucking, you know what I mean? Kind of just like brought me back down to earth a little bit. And so I think, um, you know, I learned pretty early on that like, if I'm not having fun, like I have like little success of competing and like, like doing well in a contest, you know, if I take it too serious. So like for me... I tried to kind of embody that as best as I could. 
but it kind of changed like i mean it's funny but you know up until the olympics like you're on drug testing and you're doing this and that and whatever and and all that and um you know i was taking things serious but i was having fun but i was still like really tensed up and then um you know, after the Olympics, I started getting high, you know, because I was like, man, that was like a year and a half of drug testing and blah, blah. And then I started crushing it in contests. Like, so I felt like, all right, dude, like this helps me chill out. Like I feel more creative doing this. Like I don't feel as tense. Like my body feels pretty good and I'm riding really good. So like, let's just do this, you know, and not be like too boisterous about it, but let's just run that. And Mm -hmm. So that kind of changed things too. But yeah, definitely dealing with the pressure and things like that. I mean, I think some people just love it, you know. Um, I always love like a jam format contest because you'd have, you know, three, four or five chances to put one down. And I feel like eventually, like I think too with the competition, you would see guys that maybe wouldn't land their two runs, you know, actually put one down to see like where they fit in the mix, you know. So I used to love the jam format contest when they used to run that. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about Capita Snowboards. Now, Buds, did you know Capita owns their own factory with their own damn ski slope right in the heart of the Austrian Alps and builds all their boards with self-generated clean energy? I did know that, Chris. They pull hydropower from a river on site, and they have that slope back there, which is pretty cool. Capita has built the most environmentally responsible snowboard production facility in the world. It's called the Capita Mothership. And they make some damn fine snowboards. The best boards. I've been riding for over 20 years, and I've ridden a lot of different boards. And Buds, you've been riding since 1406? Yeah, like 700 years. <laughs> 750, 700. Got a lot of like time that. on the boards. A lot of times on the boards. So you've probably seen a lot of snowboard tech come a long way. What did you think the first time you stepped on a Capita, Buds? So good, my dog. The new Capitas are available now. Check out their website or your local shop. So... I have a Patreon question for you. Speaking of the Olympics, from Stuck in Ohio. This poor guy, I mean, he sends in a lot of questions. I hope he gets out of Ohio this year. Maybe gets <laughs> get some powder in Utah or something. Let us know if you come by. But he asks, who is the first person to call you Mace Nuts? And do you still have your Team USA Olympic ring with that nickname engraved on it? I do have the ring, <laughs> and it is engraved on it. You got it <laughs> engraved custom? Yeah, yeah, you're able to like put like in- an engraving on the side. It was weird because when at the time, like the the ring fit like on my ring finger, and now it like fits like on my pinky, dude. You, know <laughs> you know were I mean? a boy, like, boys, boys, boys you know? to men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But I do, I do, I do still have it. It's cool, um, cool memory. Mace nuts, I think, was a so my my email was mace nuts at Yahoo for a long time. And I think that's kind of how it came about, but I think it might have been uh, initially a rapport between me and Scotty Lego. Um, he came out and lived with my family, and like, yeah, that first year I was on Palmer, he came out and lived with my family, and we were going to contests together, you know, basically living in my house, like we were sharing a room and stuff, and because uh, he was still living in New Hampshire and stuff. So I think that's kind of a rapport that we built, and... I would call them leg nuts, and I don't know, just stupid, like, teenage. like. Oh, that's why you, you said know? leg nuts. Yeah, 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 <laughs> for sure. And he's and he also mentioned that he's tone deaf, which is, like, anytime Scotty tries to sing a song, it's, like, never in key. Like, it's not remotely <laughs> even close. So there's always that, too. Um, I feel like email handles were the early Instagram yeah. handles. And so, True. yeah, I call him Keith Congo sometimes. He has an yeah. email address like that. It's actually Austin Granger's uh, Dick's nickname. That's what I've made mine. But, yeah, keep going. <laughs> You were, you kind of self named yourself. I nice guess nice. like I guess that's kind of that's yeah. kind of cringy a little bit. Um, you didn't mean but it. I feel like I whatever. And then it's like yeah, I feel like well, you got Bose nuts. The nicknames yeah, kind of the nicknames kind of follow you. It's like you know I think like early on my Twitter handle was Mace in the place, and then now that's my. Oh, I remember that. And then like everyone just like is like Mace in the place. You know, yeah. just like I'm like oh traveling Dan, what's up? Like it's yeah. just weird how sometimes you refer to people as their IG handle or something. Now, he, he mentioned the Olympics. Before we get into that, I just want to paint a picture of the contest scene back then because you were able to do a shit ton of contests. Now we have maybe a handful of them for the people that are in the contest scene, riding half pipe and slope. There's not a, there's not a ton of them. But <coughs> back then, you guys had quarter pipe contests. You had, <coughs> you know, slope style. New Zealand Open, U.S. Open, European Open. 
you're getting towed into quarter pipes by snowmobiles at Grand mm-hmm. Prix. It was, it was just a wild time where you guys had probably a contest every other weekend, right? You had a lot of companies buying into the events, you know, which I think, like, I don't know if social media changed that, you know, or whatever, because I feel like I kind of, like, stopped competing and stuff and sort of got dropped by sponsors, like, right before the social media pop. Like, Instagram was around, Twitter was around, and I think I there was a couple instances where I had sponsors asking me to, like, hashtag stuff. I'm like, what? Why would I? That sounds stupid. What, what does that even mean? Um, But yeah, I mean, it was back then, like you were picking and choosing like, all right, am I doing the Burton tours and going to like, you know, Nippon Open, European Open, New Zealand and doing that? Or am I going to do like do tour or like Vans Triple Crown? Like you had a lot of different events around. So, I mean, if you wanted to, I mean, you could tick off 14, 15, 16, you could go to a pipe contest every weekend. You go to a pipe contest and go to a big air contest in Japan. If you're invited, a lot of those, those contests in Japan, you get paid to show up. So you're just like, I could show up, not even do good. And I got my trip paid for and got like four grand just to come here. So that was cool. You were just collecting um, cheddar. I think it, I think it made, but it also made it sort of difficult because I mean, you had guys that were like running the fist world cup circuit that weren't really as well known in the, like, do tour and and like Vance Triple Crown events, but they're like winning the world championship fist stuff, you know what I mean? So it wasn't streamlined. I think that there were, you know, there was attempts to try to streamline it with streamline it with a world snowboard tour and the stuff that like Terrier was doing with Ticket to Ride and trying to like do that and um you know, had certain events that qualified you to go to Arctic Challenge and those kind of things. But but yeah, it was a crapshoot for sure. I think that it was really for a couple of years there. It was just like, what events do you want to do? You know? And so for me, it was, you know, where are the best pipes that I like to ride or, you know, or sometimes it'd be, you'd like, know like you could go to an event where like maybe not as many dudes would be at it. So you'd have like a better chance of winning. Like there's definitely some, t- at some point, some strategy too. that, oh no, for sure. Like Sean's definitely not coming to this contest. So like, I'm going to go here, you know, cause there was a certain time where it's like, you're fighting for second place. Because he was getting first no matter what. Pretty much. I mean, there was definitely a time when it was like that, which was, you know, a difficult time. What to, a strategic move, a, right? Sean's not going to be there. Let's or you just kind of guesstimate, you yeah. know what I mean? Is he or isn't he, you know? But, uh, you know, respect. Respect, though, for sure. Well, Buds, you know what time of the show it is? I have an idea. Name that video part. Name That Video Part is presented by Woodward. Woodward Park City is about 15 minutes from Salt Lake City, just two miles past Parley Summit, and they're open 365 days a year with twilight lift access for biking and shredding, as conditions allow. This one-of-a-kind action sports community hub takes the whole idea of huck it and hope away from action sports with foam pits, trampolines, airbags, proprietary training equipment, and some of the best coaches in the biz. You might catch Stony Buds chucking double corks into the foam pit if you go there. You never know. It also has one of Salt Lake's only indoor skate parks. You can skate rain or shine. If it's 110 or 20 below, you've got a great place to go skate. Drop in for a session or lesson or go all in with a monthly membership. You might catch Chris up there catching his edges and falling down, mopping <laughs> up the, uh, the the rail course. Yeah, we might uh, be doing some scorpions up there. Woodward Park City is a one-of-a-kind training facility with trampolines, foam pits, and coaching, all designed for progression. So if you're in the area, be sure to check out Woodward Park City. Okay, it is time to get into Name That Video part. Now, Mace, confidence levels, 0 through 10. It How de- are we It feeling? depends on the era. I sure. chewed it up for your era. If it I sounds like it. it's Subject Hawkinson, he's really got it. Yeah, it's not Subject Hawkinson, so he might be in I bet trouble. He has that memorized? I mean, let's run it. Okay. <laughs> I watched a lot of shred videos. It's been a minute. You got to give us a number, though. Zero uh, let's go. Let's go seven. Okay. That's high. I like That's it. High. Really? All right, let's go six. <laughs> he's going six. All right, here we go. It's Danny Cass, Full Metal Edges. Woo! Give you an air horn for that. <laughs> all right. I had a feeling you're going to go grenade vid on him. Well, you, that's yeah. one of the most legendary Mammoth. parts of yeah. all time. What you got here is a Yeti carry all. Woo! That's you can carry all in there. You can carry all oh, that's kinds mine? of goods. And this is all yours. Can be oh, carried, bomb hole branded. 
You got some sweatpants. Dude, you got a hoodie. You got a mug. You got some you. smelling salts you can use when you play hockey. Mm. Um, and then you got all kinds of good stuff, all available at bombhole.com if you want to get some merch too. Maybe a stocking stuffer. Uh, you know, maybe a gift for a loved one. Um, Thank you. Yep. A gift for yourself, you know. You can use promo hand. code uh, Mason is a beautician <laughs> for fourteen percent off. That's actually not true. We there's don't also have that code. Uh, bury the biscuit for three percent off, <laughs> <laughs> and they're that's like, not true. They're like, what the hell? Are these? these codes aren't working. How's it spelled? Out? <laughs> Love that. Uh, all right, for part two of name the vid- name that video part. This is for our listeners. If you know what song this is in video, comment. On Instagram, on the Bombwell's Instagram, on the photo of Mason when this episode comes out. That's where we pick our winner, and you get a prize pack. I have to say, because people are always disappointed, it's not the same prize pack no, the guests get. it's not gets. a carry Okay, it's, you're <clears> going <throat> to get some stickers, maybe a hat. If you're lucky, a hat. Yeah. If, if Jules is feeling in a good mood. Yep. Okay, here we go. Okay. I don't know it. It rings a bell, but I don't know it. Thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. part. All right, let's get back into it. Before we do, I think it's time to start things off with a little smelling salt here. You got one in there. Crack it open. Buds and I. You want to split one, Buds, or you want a Percy? I'll split. Okay. (laughs) Save them. All right. I feel like split, you get the same... uh, as a hockey player, you know the. You we know don't. We, maybe we don't yeah. want to promote on air that you can split them though. You know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, buy as many bottles yeah. as possible. No, don't split them at home, kids. It loses the toxicity. Yeah. If you once you I mean, once you, you pass get that it. initial. Yeah. You know. It's not the same. Yeah. I'll start it off. All right. <coughs> the long <laughs> sniff. <laughs> All right, let's go. Ready, ready to keep this pod rolling. I roll. love how that was a quick. Uh, Whoa! Let's see what's going on here? Let's see it. Let's see. Uh, I went back yeah. for a third, and it hit Whew. me hard that okay. third time. That's see, a that good was, one. That's a good one. Still a little bit in there. Definitely not my first rodeo, but I'm impressed. As a hockey player, that's just kind of mandatory. It's pretty standard. I, I, wonder I usually, why I usually is bring so a, big, but other sports you don't see it as well, much. Well, it's just quick, explosive shifts yeah. of energy. I bring I bring uh, salt to all my games yeah. for sure. You do. Yeah. 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 I'm older, dude. I need a little. You need you know that what I mean? kick. Yeah. <laughs> so you just snap one and then you run out there or skate. I out use there. the one that that are like powder. Like you, you get them and you Mix add it. A, you add like a teaspoon of water and it activates the ammonia or whatever. I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but yeah, it's powerful. Oh, I call we, it panther piss. That's what I. Panther piss, from what I've heard, is good. But from you know the the let the records show that run through wall smelling salts is the premier Those product. Are, it's no, the best product. The premier I'm product. not trying to cross promote okay, by any means. Sure. Yeah, for sure. You have your own brand of smelling salts? No, no, no. no, no, no. You're just, on just, just like you're a yeah. scientist over there. He's yeah. like mixing them up before your games. I just switched the name just to yeah, just He's like Panther. Walter White over there mixing it up. I feel like you could come up with a pretty sick logo for Panther. Piss. A Logie one Kenobi? Yeah, that has a lot of possibilities. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get into Olympics here. And before we get into Olympics, we got a guest question from a very prestigious Olympian and friend of yours. And person you just named their video part correctly. Oh, wow. Here we go. What a treat. Yo, Mason, what up? It's your boy, DK, Danny Cass, a.k.a. the traitor to the motherland. And um, I wanted you to tell everyone and, uh, and find out what it was we did every night together at the 2006 Torino Olympic Games. And then also, second part of that question would be, um, how did you feel about that judging? Because I think they were trying to block another American sweep. Controversial. It is controversial. That's heavy controversy right there. Yeah. I love Danny. Um, He's the man. I kind of think we should give Danny the super air horn. Yeah, yeah. I mean... (laughs) Yes. Holy moly. Another person that, that uh, you know, didn't didn't owe me anything or whatnot, but took me under their wing and gave me some opportunities, got to film with Grenade and, you know, kind of be part of that at one point. And, yeah, just awesome 
I mean, it's, I don't think it's often when you like look up to people and then you get to, you know, become friends with them and travel with them. And, you know, I mean, obviously we got to go to the Olympics together. So that was like a really cool time in my life personally, you know what I mean? Like some of, some of those, I guess like some of the relationships that you develop along the way to me were, were more memorable than contest victories or checks or whatever, you know, that was a, a nice thing that came with it. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, in terms of pa- pertaining to the question, uh, on our way to the Olympics, because me and Danny flew, we went out together because we were both living in Mammoth. About it's a, Torino, by the way. Yeah, so. Torino. Yeah, long, Torino. Long time ago. Yep. Back when we traded wagon axles and barrels of whiskey for contest invites. No. Um, bought an Xbox 360 on the way out because they had just came out with them, and we bought Call of Duty. And so we were... <laughs> So when we were when we were over there, there wasn't like uh, the the biggest like question I get about the Olympics is like, oh dude, was everyone hooking up, banging each other? And like back then, no, because like Tinder wasn't around yet. You know, I think Sochi was the big pop when Tinder was around, and people started fucking each other and stuff like that. Like at the Olympic Village, that was not a thing for for me. I had a girlfriend at the time too, so there's that. But um. We stayed in this village that was outside of Torino a couple hours where the half pipe venue was called Bardonecchia. Um, anytime you like wanted to go somewhere, you had to like go to a security checkpoint, you had to have like someone go with you. So we didn't get to explore a ton. So a lot of time was spent inside. So we played a lot of Call of Duty and uh, yeah, specifically that Call of Duty was like um, World War II against the Germans. And so like anytime that you'd like get shot and killed, it said like you were a traitor to the motherland. And so that like became... <laughs> Me and Danny's like tagline throughout pretty much our whole friendship, like even up until now, it's like, you know, will text me like, hey, trader, what are you up to? Oh, what's up, trader? Blah, blah, blah. So just one of those stupid things. But, um, but yeah, what also I remember about that trip is like Danny's feet were like so funky that whole trip, dude. Like, you know, I just remember like his feet smelling like cheese, dude. And I was like, bro, you need to have a foot doctor look at that. Like, I don't know what's going on. He just, like, thought it was hilarious. But, yeah, I'm sure <laughs> we've all been on funny. snowboard trips in close quarters where people are oh, pounding yeah. and someone's got some funk There's going always on. always somebody with a bad There's yeah. a lot of that foot cheese yeah. out there. But I was, rooming, I was rooming with Sean at the Olympics, but I was spending a lot of time. And, and Finch and Danny were in a room, but I was, I was over at Danny's because I had the Xbox over there. And so I was, yeah, we were just hanging out. It was a good time. So then this part two of the question, because you got fourth, uh, what did you think about oh, the judging? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, pff, I mean, it's been so long. But, yeah, at the time I felt like, I don't know, I guess like how they – and no, like I don't want to take anything away from Marku Koski that got third because he's also someone that I just like love to watch him ride super smooth, always had really cool combos in the pipe and stuff. And I think like it could be – the argument could be debated either way, you know what I mean? Um, but I thought for sure when I, like, came down with my score, like, it was, like, at least, like, I thought it was a second or third for sure. And so when I, like, I just felt like, like, it's almost like I just, I was like, I couldn't have done that any cleaner. Like, that was, like, I just put it down. And, like, so when the score came up, I was like, fuck. And it rattled me, dude. And I and I decked on a back nine my next run, and that was it, you know what I mean? And then, um, so it was like... uh you know what I mean? And Sean's like crying at the bottom of the half pipe, whatever Danny got. So, so I was trying to like be happy for my, my countrymen. You Who know got first mean? and second then? Sean, Sean and, Danny. and Danny. Yeah. And, and I mentioned it earlier, like Danny, like just exploded that day, dude. And it was just like boosting and put down like two of the sickest runs. Like hadn't done a, hadn't done like a switchback rodeo the entire week and like ended his run with the switchback. Like Michael Chuck, like stomped it. I was just like, what the fuck? Like, it was just really cool to, Cause I was just like, I'm not built like that. Like I have to like do my run like X amount of times to feel, you know what I mean? Like I got this. And so it was really cool to see him just like pull it together. But, uh, so yeah, so I was a little salty. I was bummed. Uh, I actually like left the Olympics like two days later. Cause I was so bummed. Like, cause it felt like up to that point, <clears throat> I kind of mentioned it before about all the drug testing and everything like that. Like you're like basically on a schedule with USADA. You have to let them know where you are. Back then, like there was no apps, there was no smartphones. You have to update on this portal on the internet. You know, if you leave town, you got to tell them where you are. So that, and coupled with sort of like sacrificing some of my high school experience to like you know pursue the Olympics and stuff, it just like felt like I put so much time and effort into like making it there. And like I think 
you know, making the team is harder than the actual contest, you know, because at the time it's kind of different now since like Japan and like Australia are kind of running the game and pipe events. Mm-hmm. But back then, like the U.S. was definitely like, we had so many guys that were so good. Like there were so many guys that didn't make the team when I went that were so close. Like Ross was super close. Kier was super close. There, you know, Danny was really close. Kevin, like it was, it was kind of anyone's like game. And so, just that qualifying process was ridiculous. But um, yeah, so it was, it was a bummer. But at the same time, I still had like three events left for the year, and um, I got home and I went to Colorado. I got home, bought a snowmobile, drove to Colorado, and just started smoking a shit ton of weed. And was just like, okay, that's over. I'm gonna take this break from competing and like go ride powder, which was something that like I hadn't done. And like went and um, hung out with Doran, Layborn, and Colin, and just dudes that I like hadn't never really like. Um, they like were super rad. Took me under their wing. Like I remember, I like dude, I like ghosted my sled into a tree like the first day I had it. Of course, you know, after I just paid ten k cash for a sled idiot but uh i feel like that was maybe like i got earned i earned a stripe you know what i mean by it's mandatory it had to happen you gotta mandatory do that you know? get a sled, right? had you, get a sled you gotta take it into the and cash. i was like pretty weak you know what i mean so like colin was the one that like dug my sled like was pulling it oh, out really? of this tree well because i was like pretty i was still pretty skinny and string like i wasn't really strong so i felt bad about that you know but as we the went. wikipedia <laughs> description yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah but we I made it back who wrote that wikipedia <laughs> description about you does, but, um, does not affect his midair maneuvers his stature but I had a uh, had Vans Cup, I had World Superpipe Champs, and the U.S. Open. Oh, big and contest! I was, yeah, so like I went to World Superpipe Champs and I won. I went to Vans Cup and got second and got fourth in slope style, and then I went to the Open and got third. So like I felt like I, you know, like that kind of I you I you was able to use that kind of like it wasn't a defeat in my mind. It's like you know the redeeming the looking back. It's like. Would me getting third in the Olympics had some direct? Would it have pit- changed my life drastically, like to where I am now? Like I don't think so. You know what I mean? Maybe for the short first term, could've, maybe. you know, first maybe yeah. could have. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it could have it could have opened some some things, and you know, maybe some opportunities and stuff. And I remember like we did a a segment with Jay Leno that night, and uh, I was like. It was like Danny, Sean, and then like me. And he was like, he's like, Where's your medal? Like blah oh, blah. Geez. And like and like Tom Green was the was the <laughs> correspondent. And like Tom's like roasting me. I'm like, yeah, like you got no medal. And I'm still just like salty as fuck about it, trying to be like, I'm like, okay, I'm on national TV. I can't like you know. So I was like, ha, ah, yeah, you know, like whatever. Like I don't even know what I said. And Sean, and no, Tom I don't Green. even know what I said. But um so yeah, so it was kind of a hard pill to swallow at the time. You know, obviously having my family there and being a part of it and whatnot, like, I I don't think that I, you know, misrepresented myself or anything like that. To my best ability, I kept it professional and was trying to put be, down a heater run. That's yeah. all you can yeah, do. Yeah, like, I was, like, I rode the best I could, you know what I mean, for where I was at at that point in time with my progression. And, like, I think that, like, it definitely, uh, you know, it definitely gave me leverage for future contracts and stuff like that, and I felt like it definitely – built my confidence from there like I started doing really well in events kind of like 06 to 09 like was really when it was like my personal like heyday when I felt like I was consistently placing well consistently showing up and was a threat like I felt like I was you know consistently getting better and trying new things and I think my attitude got a lot better too you know like I started having I mean obviously it's great when you're winning and when you're doing well but I think regardless of that because of the friend, because of the friend screw, and because we had gotten so close with Danny and and Scotty and Kevin and stuff, it was like if one of us didn't do good at a contest, like someone always did good. So like it was still like we'd go out and rage after. Like if we all shit the bed, but Scotty put it down and won the contest, we're like, fuck yeah, that's a win for us. Yeah, you all you know, won. Like, we were like, yeah, you know. So it was a different approach. It was different looking at it from kind of that lens, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, I learned to like kind of like root for other people and yeah but great experience i I love that i got to go and um yeah i wouldn't change it i have a patreon question around the friends crew okay from uh daniel jensen mason if you had to be marooned on an island with one of the original friends crew for two months who would you pick scotty that was quick he can hunt quick with it he can hunt hunt, you know what i mean and who would be your (laughs) last choice uh Probably, um, damn. 
<laughs> that's like that's, that's the harder question. Trouble, dude. That's the harder question. Probably, um, probably Kevin, dude, because he's like all in that. He's like eats flax seeds and shit like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> you pick like, seeds be on that. You're, you're like, fucking, I can't live off yeah, this. Yeah, foraging chia seeds and shit. Like, yeah, I'm like, I need something. You real. want some protein? Yeah, that's a good there, choice you know then. Yeah, yeah, for sure. She'll just hand you a handful of weird little seeds. Yeah, but Scotty's just a good time. Hand. Scotty's yeah. very much an optimist. You know what I mean? So he, he I feel like you know, he always was able to find. Uh, you know what I mean? Light in the situation and stuff. I always kept a good attitude. I'd and like I, to I, see a lady. I'd like to see like a survivor friends crew edition. Re- like, kind of you know? like naked and afraid. Yeah, like naked <coughs> and afraid type of vibe. Yeah. Maybe well, me. everyone has kids except me. So they'd have to pull up with like the dad yeah. fast dude with the kid. I would have an advantage. Like That's it's true. You know? That's true. But killer. Also with friends, uh, at one point it turned in, you guys did friends vision. You guys were doing your thing. And then there was the headphones the were headphones. popping, and it seemed like everything was going. And, and what what happened? <laughs> uh, I don't really know. I think that, uh, yeah, I think that there was, <clears throat> you know, like friends had a lot of promise and had a lot of potential. You know what I mean? And I feel like sometimes that's, you know, a dangerous thing to say, you know, because you have other people that are saying it has potential. You know, you have other people that are. You know, I was kind of just like brought into it. I didn't, you know, I'm not taking credit for starting it. Like it was a lot of like Danny and Driscoll and like Keir and stuff in the beginning. And we started with like bandanas and like film and stuff. And then at a certain point, it was like, it seemed like there was a demand for like making it some kind of entity, you know? And we were like, oh, well, do we do something like in snowboarding? And like, you know, we're looking at different categories and like who's running that. And it was like, well, we can't start like a, can't start a snowboard company. We all ride for Burton can't start a goggle company like we all have eyewear deals that are paying us good money like i had smith uh scotty was on smith kevin was on oakley danny was on dragon still is on dragon you know what i mean since 1406 i think really 1407 yeah Yeah, Yeah, the first lens was uh devised and he was able to get that the lens first goggle was lenses were made out of old school glass back then yeah Yep. Um, Hand stitched. Were you guys all like so, owners of the brand? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I think we all like that was a tough thing too. Is like uh, that many owners. big big life lesson is like don't go into business with that many friends and people. And you know, like I would say, like for me personally, it's a lot of people. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of a lot of cooks in the kitchen for sure. Um, it seemed like uh, at some point, I think you know, someone had to take sort of the authoritative like role, and I think that that person was Kier, you know, who was yeah. kind of like coming towards the end of his snowboard career and. You know, he kind of started to have that, yeah, that drop off to where, like he wasn't doing as good in events, was still like shooting some photos, but not really, like not really killing it anymore or whatever. And, you know, it happens to everybody. You know? Yeah, you, if you don't If you're a pro snowboarder out there, you don't think it's going to happen to you. It's going to happen. So just. It happens. You know, it happens. It's Life just happens. a cycle and there's younger talent and kids. And, you know, we were talking earlier that like, you know, you sneeze and cough and your back hurts. And I was like, I'm right there with <laughs> you stone on that, like for sure. <laughs> It's a bummer. But, yeah, it's um, gonna happen. There's you can't fight it. You gotta yeah, embrace it. I think that um and the contest and pipe dudes, it's younger. hmm Younger than a lot of other people. Yeah. Shorter expiration yeah. date. Like I got dropped by all my sponsors at twenty six. Yeah, which you, you know? had a great which, run because yeah, you started young. I popped early, so I feel like that was yeah, yeah it was like good. Twenty six is still so young. Yeah. There's yeah, some people so that's careers are just starting started. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I mean it was like yeah, I mean now it's like, well, it was good because now I'm, you know, 34 and, you know, I've been able to kind of reinvent myself. But um, pertaining to the friends thing, I mean, you know, it was it was definitely a gamble. I mean, you know, I put in a lot of my own money. Um, oh, you guys had to put round, in. There was different rounds of funding. There was different kind of percentages distributed based on how relevant, like, everyone in the crew was. And that was tough to, like. That's crazy. But, you know, it was tough to kind of advocate for yourself. Like, you know, at the time when we were trying to figure that out, figure all that out, Kevin was, like, winning everything. You know, beating Sean and winning everything. You know, if you've seen his documentary, it's like he was just like clipping off Sean like at every contest for a period, you know. And so Kevin had a lot of value there. So he was fighting for a certain percentage. I was just kind of like, man, this is fucking weird that we're all like, you know what I mean? Like that money's getting involved and shit. And like, this is kind of strange. And so I think initially with the headphone things, we wanted, to, we, we really had intended to stay like endemically in snowboarding. So we like got zoomies and you know some other action sports retailers to like push our stuff. The initial headphones sucked and they broke and all that stuff. So we dealt with that. And I think we had you know, I don't know like all the semantics around like what went right and what went went wrong. But 
I know I lost a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> You, you got a you got an amount. At one, at one point, it was in Best Buy. It was in like all the major stores. Yeah, right? no, and there was and there was a point when I moved to LA in 2011, and I lived in Santa Monica, and I was out like whatever at the Santa Monica Promenade, and uh, I was traveling a ton. So it was you know for me it was advantageous to live so close to LAX because I was just like when I was living in San Diego, I was 40 minutes from the airport. Santa Monica, 15. Yeah, let's let's move to LA. You know, um, but yeah, I remember like walking into Urban Outfitters, seeing Fred Hens friends' headphones, walking into Apple, seeing friends' headphones, Jeez. and walking into freaking, I forget what other store it was, but seeing our shit. And it's just like, you know, that was like, whoa, this is, I think I was in Best Buy that same week and saw him and it was just like, dude, these are like all places that like I shop and like fuck with, you know, like this is weird to see this stuff here and you get excited, you know, and you get excited when you talk to people that have run other companies um, you know, that have run successful brands that are saying, you know, this is what we think friends could be valued at, however many million. And you're thinking, okay, well, I have 3% in this company. You know, this could be my ticket out of snowboarding into something else, you know? So I was kind of riding that a little bit, that that was going to come to fruition because I also was trying to, you know, like from a positivity perspective, think that it had some reach. And even when, like, we moved into, like, the women's headphones thing, like, I was like, well, now, like, this is, like, not at all, like, how we, like, started the crew or what it was started on or whatever. And now we're just, like, trying to do, you know, fill a gap in the in the industry, which, like, I guess, like, I I could understand, like, Kier's argument with, like, why we needed to be there or whatever. But it seemed like, okay, now we started out as, like, this crew of shred kids who were, like, pushing, like, a women's headphone brand. Like, so it was very not, like... Um, I don't think it really aligned with like what, like we weren't excited about it. You know what I mean? Um, and you just like are sort of like on the ride at that point, you know, like I'm however much thousands invested in, like I'm like supposed to be getting money paid back to me. It's not getting paid back to me. I got contracts coming up, you know, that may or may not get renewed. They didn't, you know? And so I'm just kind of freaking out, you know what I mean? And so I'm tr- I'm like, where's the money, you know, like that I was con- contracted to give, you know? And, um, you know, so I had a little bit of a falling out with Kier at that time. Uh, you know, we've since like rekindled our friendship and you know what I mean? Like I, I uh, yeah, like I'm, you know, he's doing, seems like he's doing good and in, uh, in the cannabis industry doing some consulting and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it was a fucking shit show, you know? There had so, to be money coming in when it's there, going in I, yeah, Apple I and I yeah, I don't know where it urban. was going. That's yeah. what I was that's what I was wondering. Still I was like, nobody where knows. It? Yeah, I mean we had an office in Encinitas and you know, we were trying to it seemed like yeah, it seemed like shit was rolling for a while. I know like I know like the the last thing that I really saw about friends when I was just like I was just like done with the whole situation and I think, you know, at this point Scotty was trying to sue him and all this stuff, but there is a Shark Tank episode. That, like, you could find it on YouTube, you know what I mean? Where Kier and, and one of the other dudes that, like, no one really, I don't even think, like, knew him was working for us. They went on a Shark Tank episode trying to get money oh, wow. for friends. And, like, um, Ashton Kutcher was the guest shark and whoever. And I had, like, just gotten back from a music festival and was at my buddy's house in L.A. And we watched the episode and it was just, like, a train wreck, dude. <laughs> like, they, like, Mr. Kier, Wonderful, rip yeah, of the shreds. Oh, they just they got... Cooch they just got in. I think, I think that they, they asked about the profit and the loss. Did he punk you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that it was... Um, I think they did a good pitch. And so I honestly don't really remember. Maybe it was... Yeah, I think it was pretty good, you know, about, you know, this women's headphone market or whatever. But when they asked about the financials and the numbers, I think it was something like they had lost like seven million in two years. And I'm just like, we uh, we had that much money at all? Like what? Or something. It was some absurd number yeah. like that. Maybe maybe I'm overshooting it, maybe I'm undershooting it, but it was like wow. And so pretty much after that, you know, they pretty much, you know, torched uh yeah, they pretty much flamed Kier on that situation. I felt bad. I felt bad to see him getting. Mr. You know, Wonderful's his, ruthless. You know? He's ruthless. Yeah, yeah, when they see a hole like that they're, with finances, yeah. Yeah. they are. And like I think that there's blood a blood in the water. Mm-hmm. I think the there's a lot. The there, yeah, yeah. I think that there's you know looking back now and that I'm kind of like clear of that financial resentment and like that point in my life. I'm sure that there was a lot going on behind closed doors that I didn't know about. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because for me, like I was still trying to keep my snowboarding career alive. I was wrapped up in my own financial stuff. 
I was partying more. Like, I had other shit going on, you know what I mean? So that was just another thing that was bothering me, you know what I mean? So I'm sure that... I know if, I know that Kier probably tried to make it work and the people that were working for us tried to make it work. And, you know, I think that even the most successful people, like, didn't hit it big on their first company. You oh, know? for sure. It, it made me really apprehensive to go into business for myself as a barber, you know what I mean? Because I had this, like, this thing that I put money into that failed, you know? And so, I, and I was like, and it wasn't just, like, some small amount of money. Like, I mean, I was in pretty pretty deep. So... Um, but yeah, it was a big learning experience, you know, I think for someone that barely graduated high school that had no college education to be a part of a, to be a part of a brand and to see it get into this, there was some victories there, you know, and there was some things that came away that, that I took away from it that were good for sure. And I'm like grateful that I got to be a part of it. And I think that's maybe the better angle to look at it from versus like, I got fucked over. I lost all this money, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? So that's kind of like my stance with it now is like, you know, like I got to be a part of this. I got, you know, and, and for me, like it didn't sever any relationships with any of the guys on my end, you know, I don't know if it, if it's different for them in terms of their relationship with Kier and EK and some of these guys, or if they even talk or whatever, but like in terms of like me and Kier, like we're cool. Love you, Kier. Uh, Danny, everybody. I mean, it was, you know, it was a shit show, you know, but I think that, uh, Everyone seems to be doing pretty good as far mm-hmm. as as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so the you know, in the long stretch of things, like at the time, yeah, it stunk and whatnot. But it seems like we've all sort of like learned well, if, from if it. If you put in that money, they all put in that money yeah. too. Mm-hmm. So, all right, let's change gears here. We're gonna uh, we're gonna get into kind of life after boarding and what unfolded. I want you to kind of walk us through that period of your life. Um, probably around. <clears throat> I want to say 2012, 13, I was, you know, I remember I had like, uh, I had left Burton, uh, Driscoll had left Burton, gone to Nike. There was an opportunity to go for them. Uh, you know, as a kid that played sports, you know, I thought that that was going to be a great thing. It was, you know, and then, um, I was like, we'll just figure out the, you know, I tried to, tried to like stay on Burton Hard Goods, but it didn't work out. So that just ended and it wasn't like bad blood or anything like that. I think just my time was up there and I got a great contract with, with Nike. And my agent was like, dude, you know, got, got Nike, got K2, I resigned, I signed with Rockstar. And he was like, dude, this will probably be the most money that you'll make in your career. And then after this, I can almost promise you that these contracts are going to be like, you know, whoever you resign with, it's not going to be this much money. You know, he didn't say like it was never going to, I wasn't going to get resigned at all. But so I was kind of like, that was in my mind. Like, yeah, like I'm preparing that, like maybe after this, I may be moving into more of a supportive role, like an ambassador for these brands and maybe not as front facing the face at contests or whatever, because, excuse me, um, Because at that time, like, I, you know, I guess, like, I'd been around for a little while. Like, I think I'd been pro for 10 years. So it was like, yeah. Um, But, uh, you know, and and I didn't start, I wasn't doing as well at contests. I mean, I get a podium here and there. But, you know, the, like, the contest circuit, like, levels, like, went into double corks. I went into this and that. Like, Kevin's injury happened. That kind of woke some of us up. I was like, when Kevin's thing happened, I was like, dude, I could die snowboarding. Like, that. my mortality had really never been in check before that happened, you know. It's not his fault that I, you know what I mean, like, was affected in that way. But I think it affected everyone kind of differently and, it's a very serious thing and you know it's awesome that Kevin's healthy and doing great today and stuff and you know what a cool what a cool story on its own you know that he's had um but uh I think that you know something that kind of goes hand in hand with being a snowboarder is that you know partying was always a thing you know like I had been I, my first trip to Switzerland when I was 15 like there's no drinking age there go on there, drink, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm mostly for the majority hanging out with older kids. So when I'm back home in Mammoth, people are offering you stuff and whatever. And I never felt like that peer pressure, but you know, I was always open-minded to try stuff. And, um, so yeah, so at the time it was really just like, I was just smoking a lot of weed and, you know, getting like, just getting drunk and stuff like that. And sometimes they get tight at the wrong time or whatever, or, whatnot but um I was like living in LA and I was making money and the phone like wasn't ringing as much to do things like events and photo shoots and stuff but I was still collecting and so I was like kind of bored 
But I was like, you know, I had the $85,000 BMW. I was living in a house in the valley with my brother. Like, I had money coming in still. I was like, all right, like, my contracts are going to be up for renewal in the spring. Like, I was trying to figure out at that time, like, uh, that was the first year that I, like, didn't have an invite to X Games. And so and I couldn't even remember how long, 12 years or something like that. So I was like, all right, I'm going to pivot and try to film. So I was, like, willing to pay for a filmer out of pocket. So I got in with, like, Aaron Hooper. He was doing a movie. Um, yeah, the first Given movie. That didn't, like, and that didn't materialize how I thought it would. And, you know, like, looking back, was I partying too hard then? Whatever, probably. You know, like, it's not. So um, you were snowboarding and partying. Yeah, and, like, I was living in L.A. So it was, like, there was that aspect to it. And so, um, like, maybe was... I don't know. Like, I guess I wasn't like living in a reality that like maybe it was kind of coming to an end and like, or it was heading in that direction. And I was so scared. Like, I didn't know who to talk to about it. I didn't know anyone else that had really gone through that transition afterwards. And the, and the tough thing was for me is that like, I was healthy in terms of like my body felt good. Like yeah. I wasn't treating my body good, but you're like, only 26. I, yeah. So like, I felt like I got gas up in the tank. I could go film. I could go do things. So I pretty much started like drinking and getting fucked up a lot out of boredom. You know, like not because I, I didn't, you know, I grew up, I had a great childhood, you know, I wasn't abused, you know, I was a popular kid, you know, like had a great community or snowboarding, whatever. Um, I just liked the way I feel when I put drugs in my system. What, what, kind of, what kind of drugs are we talking? Just like the standard party stuff, you know, like Molly, cocaine, you know, psychedelics, you know, I never got into opiates and like, you know, intravenous drug using I, I was like a culture vulture, so it's like I I did what what other people I hung out with did. I didn't really know any kids that shot dope, you know, or did heroin. So I didn't feel compelled to want to try it. I'm sure if I would have been around that crowd and stuff, like I don't see why I wouldn't, you know, because I'm a drug addict, you know. So there's that. But um, you yeah, know, it mammoth seems like it's made of cocaine sometimes. I mean, dude, there's an insidious side to mountain towns, dude. Like, I've done so much fucking tr drugs in Breckenridge, dude. Yeah. Like, Bale, you Breckenridge, know, like, I, I tore it up one night before, uh, before due to her qualifiers. I, I thought I was going to, thought because I was at Cecilia's early enough that I was like, that I could do some Molly and some mushrooms. And I was like peeking at like 3 a.m., like, dude, I have qualifiers tomorrow. And I remember like holding both my boards, walking to the pipe, throwing up purple Gatorade, like, Jesus, please, God, anything, get me out of this today. Like, this is all bad. And, I fucking qualified second in the finals for pipe, and I qualified like six in the slope finals. Just fucked up. Damn. Like, and I like got, and there was you know, someone else in the crew that was with me who I'll leave out because I don't want to incriminate yeah, them. But I, them. I, but I have no problem sharing it. But uh, and so there was Dude, a part what of message me. Message does that send to you? I have no. I, I, I got for second me, yeah. After I mean, a party night, yeah. And so, and I think like all in all, I think I ended up getting fourth in the contest and stuff. And I, but I was like, I'm never doing that again. Like that was so dumb, you know. But I still qualified second and beat all these motherfuckers. So like whatever, you know. So there was definitely like an arrogance inside a little bit that maybe wasn't like a a way that I portrayed myself outwardly, but kind of inside, like oh, well, I can get this done when I'm fucked up too, you know. Like whatever. Not that I like felt good doing it but um so there was definitely you know some like reckless behavior and stuff going on before it was like front facing and like a full-on problem but I think that uh you know what what really like drove it for me was um you know like I got a call from from Dave Driscoll in uh you know probably March of 2013 and he was like you know basically telling me that Nike was pulling out and um you know, they weren't going to renew my contract. And this is actually before I knew that Nike was coming out of the game completely. So I, th I felt like just devastated that I was one of these guys that was getting cut, you know, because they were paying me a lot of money. And so I was just like, dude, this sucks. Like, oh, my God. You know, I've never had – from that point on, it had only been, like, leveling up. It had only been, like, contract negotiations for more money and more things and more opportunities. And now I'm, I'm here and I'm, like, you know – like talk to my agent and all this stuff and trying to figure, you know, I'm like, well, we could definitely get like another, like there's definitely more deals we could get for sure. Blah, blah. But like at the time, like was, was my value like increase? Was it decrease? Like, was I just deemed as like, if, if I was looked at as just a pipe rider and obviously I wasn't doing well in pipe contests and where is my value at all? So that's something I struggled with. And then shortly thereafter, a couple months following, I got the call from K2, you know? Dominoes, which was like at that point in the summer, and you know, like I was just like, 
by that point I was pretty off to the races, dude. Like I was getting fucked up every day. I was going out, just finding like after that call from Nike happened, I booked a ticket to Cancun and left the next day. Went on like a six day bender in Cancun just because I, I just like couldn't deal. Like I couldn't deal with the loss of it, you know. And it was just, you know, I, I think that um, I always sort of had this uh, this mo that snowboarding isn't who I am. It's just a part of, part of who I am, and I have all these other interests and things that I'm into and yada yada. But when that stuff started to happen in Domino, I think I realized like how much of my identity really was wrapped up in me as a snowboarder, and that I really didn't know like if I don't have snowboarding, and then all that's left is the party, and like what is that even, you know? And so that kind of like. Um, and then, you know, Rockstar was cool. They kind of kept me on, like, an option year and, like, paid me a couple grand a month, and that was really cool, Steve Mateus, to kind of, like, keep me rolling on that. But it wasn't enough for me to sustain based on how I was, like, living, you know, because I kept spending money. I kept going to Vegas. I kept doing shit. I kept, like, I just kept, like, I didn't reel it in. And um, so that was difficult, and I think that, too, I was, like, also struggling with... Uh, Man, like I was struggling with managing the money because at this point I had kind of taken over my finances from like my mom helping me out. And like I was like, yeah, I got it, whatever. So do you have any questions? Like do you need any help on like how to make these tax payments and how to do this stuff? And I was like, no, no, like I'll figure it out. Did not figure it out. Did not send in the payments. Just thinking it would go away. Pulling money out of my retirement early. You know what I mean? Like my financial guy in Minnesota is like, dude, like I like don't advise this. Um, but like if I was like, dude, I don't like have any other money coming in. Like, I need 50 grand. Like, sure, withhold the taxes, whatever, you know, because I pulled that money out prematurely and the taxes were withheld, I thought that I didn't have to file. Oh, <laughs> so wow. I fucking, and you just, I mean, it. I'm like, this is my like cocaine brain. Just yeah. like, I don't like, I'm, a, you know what I mean? Just you're like, watching the coffers young just idiot, deplete. Dude. Yeah. And I'm just like, what's going on, you know? And so I didn't, you know, that didn't happen until much later to where I realized, like, wow, I really fucked up. But, um, so for the, about the next two years, it was just Mason figuring it out. Whenever I'd run into someone from, like, whether it was, like, one of the homies or someone, or I'd go to Mammoth, they're like, so, dude, like, what have you been up to? Like, what's been going on? Like, are you still, like, I saw that you're not on, like, K2 anymore and, like, no like no more Nike and stuff. Like, I was like, oh, I'm, like, figuring it out. And so, you know, for the next year, I kind of, like, um, I did try to wing it. K2 still sent me some boards, which was, like, cool, I guess. I was still salty about it. And then, like, um battalion actually sent me some decks which was chill and uh you know i got some outerwear from like 686 from mccarthy and um you know i felt grateful to have a support in that regard you know kyle sent me some stuff from electric so i still felt like all right there's people still like kind of fucking with me and supporting me like that's cool you know but i wasn't making any money no checks just products yeah. so i tried to like do the film thing one more year i was like oh maybe i'll do this like little like web series and mammoth like you know i, I think like I was not clear headed by any means, so there was no real sound plan. But basically that like year of snowboarding, my like last I would say full year trying to like ride was mostly just me and Mammoth getting fucking bombed and like not producing and just kind of upholding the image that everything was going well or whatever, because I was like, No, like yeah, battalions helped me out or you know, 686 sent me some stuff. Like, maybe, like, next year we'll get something cooking. Like, no, there was not any, you know, conversation. And my and at a certain point, I talked to my agent, Steve, and he was like, dude, I love you. And, like, you know, like, you've done great. Like, maybe it's time to start thinking about, like, the next thing. And I was like, that was like someone speaking a foreign language to me. I was like, what? what? Like, all I've ever done is snowboard. What do you mean the next thing? Like, I started when I was six. I'm 26. The last 20 years have been this and that's it. Like, this is all I ever have done, you know? So what do you mean the next thing? Like, I don't have anything else I'm good at, you know? Like, so, you know, I've, you know, my shop sponsor, Valsurf, gave me the opportunity to come work there and sell snowboards. And I was, like, not showing up as a good employee there. I mean, whatever. And they gave me an opportunity. Like, I was doing, you know, I didn't get caught necessarily. But, I mean, I admitted later on that I was struggling and stuff to Brandon, my, my team manager at the time. And... It was just, you know, it was so hard to be around snow. Like, yeah, I think I did okay in snowboard sales and stuff, but it was so hard to sit in these clinics with reps and be and see the videos on TV and, like, be in a shop and, like, not be in it, you know? It, like, made it worse, you know? Like, it just felt like, yeah, it just felt, you know, it was, it was cool that I had something to do, but 
I did not feel fulfilled by it. And I know that some people make that transition into maybe sales rep or whatever, and like it's very fulfilling. And I think that's freaking awesome. You know what I mean? And I, I maybe thought that like I would just because of my. I was telling Chris this earlier. Like maybe because of my tenure as a snow. Oh, I've been doing this for twelve years professionally. Someone will give me a job. You know, someone's like, gonna call. Yeah. It's like uh, reminds me of like Dale in the movie Step Brothers, and he's like, "We're a family of doctors." <laughs> he's, he's a house of learned he's doctors. A house of learned doctor. doctors. <laughs> he's like Dale. I'm a doctor, like you know, that type of shit, you know. But um, did you spend it all? Eventually, yeah, I did, and a lot of it was uh, so. Like, I took a job, like going back to Mammoth as a snowboard coach. That didn't pan out how I, you know, that didn't pan out in my mind how I wanted it to. Everything was like, if it wasn't good enough for me, it wasn't good at all, you know. So I was really dealing with this, battling with this inner ego about what I feel like I deserve and blah 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 and all this shit. And I had a big chip on my shoulder about it, and um, I didn't realize any of that shit man until i got sober you know what i mean i just place, i man. just thought that you know i just victimized myself and wanted people to feel bad for me and all this shit and all this stuff and uh yeah eventually the money ran out and um you know like fucking moved to san diego and was i was at a certain point i was driving uber fucked up i would like go to the gas station pound a couple of mike's hard lemonades and like drive people around in uber oh damn Bag of blow on the little visor, like just Alicia key bumps, like while I'm dropping people off. Like not smart. I've never heard not that. Not smart Alicia at all. Key bumps. <laughs> I love it. Not smart. Didn't get caught. I don't know how I didn't. Um, don't recommend it. Not proud of it. Rock bottom. But right it was. There? Yeah, I think it was like I think it was, and I was uh, like hide, hiding everything from the girl I was with at the time. And there was just, yeah, it was like, I, I, I was like kind of dabbling, trying to go to some AA meetings and check that kind of thing out. But then I would like leave and I would like go get fucked up. Cause I didn't like what I heard or whatever. And I think at the, I think at the end of the day, man, I just hadn't experienced enough pain. I think that as a, as an alcoholic, man, I got a high threshold for pain, you know? So like, even though like all the signs were there that like Mason needed help, and people were worried about me, family, friends, whatever. Maybe I didn't, like, know it. You know, maybe people weren't saying, like, hey, man, like, I'm worried about you. You maybe need to, like, get help. Like, there was never that type of conversation yet anyway. Yeah, from the first time I started to kind of, like, realize that I, I had a problem, um, it wasn't really me that that uh, was, you know, that was the decider that I was in a relationship at the time. And the girl I was with, you know, she... Uh, woke up, you know, one morning and she's like, Mason, you're a fucking alcoholic and I'm not staying here to watch whatever this is, like, continue. So, like, I'm out. And she left and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I think any smart person would do in my situation. And so, you know, that went on, you know, until I got sober is about another 14 months from that, you know. So I was doing all that mm -hmm. shit that I was mentioning, you know. I mean, um, eventually... Um, at this point, I'm, like, definitely not snowboarding, you know. I'm just in San Diego. I was caddying at a golf course. I was working at a golf course. I was driving the Uber thing, but also, like, spending money on drugs, that little money that I was making, um, living in, like, a guest house with the girl I was with, like, of her mom's basement, who was, like, honestly really supportive and compassionate towards my situation. Her mom was, so, like, I felt like I had some support, but I was, like, yeah, I was struggling. I didn't know really what was going to change, and... um you know, I, I had a talk with my folks and my mom and stepdad lived in South Carolina and they're like, Hey, like, you know, we'd love to see you like come out here, you know? And I was like, yeah, no, I, that's it. Like, I just need a break from being here and I just need to like hug my mom or like, I just need to like see family. That's going to like, that's going to be the, the great fix here, you know? So like. I flew out and, you know, got bombed in the airport and, like, show up. And, and I'm, like, you know, 230 pounds, dude. I look like ass, you know. I've just been, like, eating like shit, snorting shit, drinking a shit ton. Like, just not, like, uh, like throwing up blood in the morning, like, shit and blood. Like, it was bad. And I, Damn. like, never went to the hospital. Like, I'm just like, oh, yeah, and I'll just chalk that up. as like, I'm just, like, I don't know. That's, you know, not normal, but I'm not going to, like, do anything about it. Like, it's weird how, like, just unwell I was. Like, I don't really know what my thought process really was. Um, but I got to Charleston and, like, was at my parents for a couple of days. And, you know, they, my stepdad and my mom and sister sat me down and they just, you know, they offered me help. And a lot of the stuff my stepdad said I didn't at the time, I was like, damn, he's being kind of harsh. You know, he's like, 
He's like, let me tell you the truth about your life, Mason. <laughs> and he was like, you've blown through millions of dollars. You're a fucking drug addict. You don't have a job. You can't even afford dog food for your dog. You're behind on your car payments. You don't have a place to live. So, like, how is it really going? And I was just like, you know, I look across and I just see the look on my mom's face and see the look on my sister's face. And it was just devastating, you know. Um, I think that was, you know, that conversation. And, I'm, you know, even though it hurt, you know, I was so grateful my stepdad was able to, like, tell me the truth. And for the first time in a long time, I actually listened. And was like, you know what? Maybe he's not entirely full of shit here. And, like, I actually, like, am fucked up. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, it was hard at the time. But, you know, they were willing to help me out. And I was not really open to going to treatment and wanting to get sober. But I was, like, willing enough to, like, go to the street. It was weird. Like, I was like, well, I'm, gonna, I'm still going to smoke weed after I leave this place. Like, I'm still going to do LSD, yeah, like, you know, like, for drug, sure. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah like, like, psychedelics, like, are still yeah. on the table here. Um, so I went to rehab, and, you know, it wasn't, like, some 30-day spin-dry rehab center. It was six months, long-term inpatient, like, put all my bills on hold, like, all this shit. My parents, my stepdad went out and got my car, voluntarily repossessed it for me. Not, like, well, yeah. How, how'd you like pay for rehab? Favor. My parents paid for it, um, and it was, and I got a partial scholarship from a nonprofit called Greener Grasses, which is really rad. Um, I've, they've they've helped me get some other friends into treatment, and they basically like help people get scholarships into rehab, which is really. I think that they have a really cool thing going on, and um, yeah, I mean the rehab for what it is was affordable, eight hundred bucks a month, you know, like oh, room and cheap. board. Yeah, so that's I mean, cheap. I guess all in it was like around five k, but I mean, I didn't have it, and so. <laughs> Um, you know, my parents were like, look, we will pay for this one time. We're not doing this like bullshit where you like go in, come out, start getting fucked up again, go in and come out. Um, you know, they won't have a problem with me saying this, but my, my mom has been sober 34 years. My stepdad's been sober 35 years. I have a lot of experience working with alcoholics, drug addicts, all this stuff. And I think they did the, the best thing they could do for me was let me run my fucking life into the ground. My, they my, were my, watching. My, my mom it sent me a, my mom sent me a letter when I was 90 days sober. And she said, as a mom, you want to fix it. You want to fix the problem. But as an, as an alcoholic, I had to let you come to your truth. And then hit you and with that tough like, love and yeah. tell you what's up. And at the time, like, you know, I, I had been sober 80-something days or whatever, and I was like, yeah, that's real shit, you know? And she was like and, – and and for me too, like they say that like alcohol, like like being – like alcoholism is a family disease, you know? Like it doesn't just affect the one person. And for the longest time, like my drug addiction, my alcoholism only affected Mason and no one else. That was my that – I, that was my thing. Like I was so subscribed to that. And in that letter, my mom's saying, like, you know, the the nights, the sleepless nights that me and your stepdad have sat awake waiting for the phone call that you fucking killed somebody in a car, got DUI, did this, hurt somebody, whatever. Like, we're so glad that we don't have to do that today. You know what I mean? And so it really opened my eyes into, like, dude, this isn't just about me. Like, I've put my family through shit, you know, like I've, you know— and so um, I'm so grateful that, like, they didn't enable me and, like, send me to a 30-day treatment and do all the, you know, it was all a part of the plan. And uh, not that there was a plan, but I think that once I was out of options, I was actually able to, like, be like, all right, well, this is, like, the only option I have is to, like, go to this rehab and, like, get sober. So I should probably just, like, take this, see what happens, whatever. And um I had, like, the greatest six months of my, like, adult life, dude. It was, like, sober summer camp. In rehab. Mm-hmm. Great. Really weird to say. That is but great. I, you know, like, I got there. I, you know, some, you know, people explained what alcoholism is to me and what drug addiction is. And it's not just, you know, then all, everything that kind of comes with it. And uh, realized that, like, I'm, I'm not unique, man. Like, I can't get out of here and smoke weed anymore. Like, I can't do psychedelics. If I'm, if I'm a true powerless drug addict and alcoholic, like, this shit is going to lead me right back to the shit that I used to do 
You know what I'm saying? Like, did weed kill me? No. Like, you know, I had some of the best experiences in my life doing LSD and mushrooms. Like, I had some I had 10 years of great partying. I had three years of really bad partying. And that three years will fucking, t- you know what I mean, outweigh that 10 years of, of good drinking or whatever, good substance, partaking all day. So it doesn't take, it didn't take long for it to take me down. And, uh, and yeah, but dude, there's hope. There's hope, dude. Like I've like up until I went to that rehab, I think in terms of like, probably from that time that I like went on that powder trip after the Olympics until I got sober, I was never not on a substance for more than four days. I would, if it wasn't, you know, any type of drug, it was weed or whatever or something. And, you know, it was never pills and shit like that, but, but, you know, it was always something. You know, so, and then when I was actually trying to sort of like chill on it, I was like, all right, like, I'm just gonna like drink beer on the weekends, dude. Love you know this. what I mean? A little bit of wine during the week, sophisticated, pinky out, you know, and like, we're just gonna chill on the hard liquor and like everything else. And like, I did that and it like worked for a couple months. And then I'm like, sick, I'm not hungover, I'm not this and that, whatever. And then like, I would celebrate by like going to get an eight ball. Weird. Why? You know, just fucking my brain, just being fucking alcoholic, dude. I always tell people, like, alcoholics have a lot of good ideas, man. Oh, it's, it's, that, it's that threshold for pain combined with good ideas. Oh, fuck yeah, I'm going to do this yoga routine, dude. I'm like, that's going to make me not want to snort anything. Like, that's my idea. No. Like, for me, like, no, it didn't. For some, and it's, and it's, uh, I'm not saying that, like, uh, 12-step programs are the only way to get sober. That's, you know, more or less what has worked for me. Um, other people do different shit. We were kind of talking about this last night and, you know, there's definitely other things out there, but, um, for me, that's, that's really what it was. And, uh, you know, I did the six months. I I hadn't remembered the last time that I followed through with something I said I was going to do. So like I was emotional leaving the treatment center, dude. Like, okay. I didn't, I didn't bitch out. I didn't leave early. Like I did the six months and I'd, and I put in, like, I put in the work on myself, too. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, was, I was, I guess what you would say, like, I was, like, a model resident. So I I was, like, working in the office there the last three months. The whole treatment center is run by residents, minus the uh, program director and the assistant manager and the supervisor. No one else is paid. So, like, from the meals that are made to the lawn that is kept to the greenhouse and flower beds to, um, you know, all the office admin stuff, that's all done by residents. So it's basically like that's how it runs. And so, you know, you have some accountability and some things going on through the day, and I learned to appreciate that. Um, But, yeah, and, and, uh, you know, after that, I think I, I, you know, I I gained some perspective on, like, the friend screw situation. I gained some perspective on, like, my other resentments and shit that I had going on. Like, I was able to kind of, like, realize that, like, yeah, that portion of my snowboarding career, like, that was over. You know, and like, even though I didn't know what I was going to do next, like I, uh, you know what I mean? I had some clarity for sure on like what, what was going on. And I'm, you know, I dropped 30 pounds. I looked normal again, as normal as can be, I guess. And, uh, you know, definitely was like, you know, not blaming anyone else except for me. Like I definitely got to a place where I was like taking accountability for my actions and stuff. Um, and that was just the beginning, dude, you know? Like, yeah, I was, I was hyped that I got six months and it was great. And I, and I, I wanted to keep going. So I was like, all right, let's like see like what this sober life is like outside of here. You know, I don't know what it's going to be like going to a concert. I don't know what it's going to be like going to a game or going snowboarding or whatever. When everything that I ever did, concert, game, tattoo, appointment, whatever, drinking and drugs were the main event, the, you know, NHL game or the festival like that shit was secondary you know even snowboarding became secondary you know like when I went to at a certain point when I went up riding like the bar was my main focus I would maybe go take a couple laps after I was fucked up but I wasn't like there's no one there to film me or watch me or whatever so you know drinking was always the main event so it's like how do I get to you know a place where I can enjoy these things sober you know live life normal sober um so it's been you know it's been a trip dude really has been five and a half years now it's amazing man five and a half years and you never after that six months you never went back no i never went back um that's almost kind of rare isn't it 
I mean, you know, I, I would get when I worked in the in the when I was working in the office of that treatment center the last three months. They taught you know basically you take calls from parents, you know, like my parents were. They were like, dude, my kid. Oh my god, like he needs help. You know, I get that shit every day. And the parents would always be like, well, what's what's the success rate? What's the success rate? And I'm like, the success rate is a 100, percent but it's contingent upon when you leave here after the six months like what you do. And so I wasn't necessarily speaking from experience because I was still at the treatment center. But after that, like I knew what I had to do, you know what I mean? I had to get active in recovery and, um, you know, keep my side of the street clean and, you know, try to work on, work on myself. And, you know, I was, I was, I knew that there was more out there for me for my life, dude. Like I knew that there was, I didn't know what my first year and a half sober, dude, I worked at Whole Foods market, bag groceries. I went from making a half a million dollars a year snowboarding to bagging grocery for $12 an hour, you know, for a year and a half. And I had, I had multiple occasions. I had people recognize me in the store from Kevin Pierce's documentary in South Carolina. And I was just like, they're like, what are you doing working here? Like what? And I'm like, oh, this, it's, a, it's a long story, but yeah, uh, it's nice to see you. Humbling. <laughs> Enjoy right there, those huh? parsnips and those <laughs> organic avocados. That you paid the whole trade grapes, for. chef's kiss. Um, <laughs> So that was humbling, dude. Yeah. Like, that was, I mean, if there was, you know, if I hadn't already had my ego deflated enough, you know, I went and worked at a grocery store for a year and a half. And, you know, my mom was like, honey, you don't need the job. You just need a job. Okay. Just a job to yeah. you know, do this, that, and the other. And I was like, okay, cool. And so like, I, I went and interviewed at a Starbucks and I interviewed at a, at Whole Foods and, you know, I knew at Whole Foods I could like wear a beanie to work and stuff and like, kind of just like dress like me. So I was like, I'm going to go work there, you know? So I did that and um yeah dude I mean it's been it's been really really weird at times but uh and you know I miss you know like I miss snowboarding you know I do um but and I always have that you know I never thought that like uh you know at a after about a year of working at Whole Foods I decided that like I don't want to be climbing the chain of grocery store management I applied to be a supervisor I interviewed really well I didn't get the position and that kind of like opened up all right like maybe I should go to a trade school and get into something that could you know maybe help me financially like come up a little bit and like give me some purpose you know because I I always tell people that you know sobriety saved my life cutting hair gave me purpose, you know, because I think that what I was lacking up to that point that I was, you know, grateful I was sober. I was grateful for, you know, my health and stuff like that. But at a certain point I was like, but I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm fulfilling my purpose talking about freaking kale, dude, you know, like it's tight or whatever, but like, you I'm need not to find that passion. Yeah. Right? Like I needed to find something. And so kale, I had a couple, it wasn't your passion. Yeah. No, I had a couple of homies in LA that were barbers. That I had known from, that I had met through snowboarding, oddly enough, like at X Games or whatever. And, you know, they, they were doing some big things in the haircutting world. And I was like, hey, man, how do you like being a barber? Just DM, Instagram DM. What's it like? What kind of money are you making? You provide for your family, flexibility, whatever, box check, box check, box check. You know, I didn't know anything about cutting hair, but I was like, maybe this is like a pathway for me to get back to what I took advantage of so much in snowboarding, which was the flexibility the autonomy, the creative outlet, the individuality. These are all things that I had throughout my snowboarding career that I just dis dismissed, that it was just, like, supposed to be given to me, you know? Reality fucking bites when you start working for other people, dude, and you get that check, and you're like, what, dude? I made $700 in two weeks? Like, what the fuck? You know, like, it's... It, and it's not all about money, of course, but, like it definitely puts it into check that, uh, you know, there's other ways to provide and things like that. And so, you know, I've just kind of like went into it blind and like, you know, the great thing about applying for, I've never applied for financial aid or anything like that. And like the great thing about being poor is that you get all this financial aid, which was sweet. So I was like, I qualified for grants from the government and got money for this and that. And so I'd still had to take out loans and everything like that, but I had a little help, you know, which was cool. And I had the support from my family and I had people behind me that were like, you can do whatever, you know? And so it was really humbling going from being, uh, you know, whatever snowboard guy, like knowing what the fuck I'm doing to like being in barber school, having no idea what I'm doing, being terrible at it, learning a new skill, 
did I mention being terrible at it? I was bad. <laughs> like I'll maybe send through some some haircut photos from when I first started. It was bad. When he started, yeah, no skill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Six dollar haircuts, top of the line barber college, dude. But I mean, I just stuck it out. I trusted the process. All these like hair classes I would go to, people were like, just trust the process that you're gonna get better. And I was like, oh, this is like. You know, it feels like my mom telling me, just be grateful, you know? Like, I was just like, I don't want to hear another person say trust the process and whatever. And, you know, eventually, like, I got licensed. I got um, I got rolling. And, um, man, I, I, I felt like my snowboarding would never help me in whatever I did next. I was like, that sucks that, like, that 12 years was just purely, like, skill-driven. And now, like, there's no way I can utilize that um, in, like, this new thing I'm doing you know what I mean but I was like so wrong you know I think that I had a lot of exposure media training interviews um meeting people um starting you know being a part of a company that kind of carried over into like dealing with and the Whole Foods job too dude like I learned how to deal with people on a mass mass level you know being a cashier at a grocery store you're ringing up four or five six hundred people a day Dealing with, you know, happy customers, angry customers, whatever, you know what I mean? And you're just like more or less just being like run over by people. And so you learn to kind of build tolerance for that and appreciate that. And so there was a lot of like redeeming things that came out of all those like sh quote unquote shitty jobs I had, you know what I mean? Because every every little thing like it, it held its purpose, you know, and I see that now at the time I didn't see it, but like. I mean, I've done other interviews before. They're like, well, would you change anything? And blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, honestly, no, I wouldn't. Because, like, if I, even if I just, like, quit drinking and doing drugs and, like, didn't do any of the work on myself, I would just be an asshole that didn't drink. You know, I wouldn't have gained. Still be an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah. I, I would still be, I'd be untreated alcoholic. Mm -hmm. just when you were dickhead. super young, did you work any of those weird jobs, like the Whole Food type of stuff? Mm -mm. Or did you just skip that stage? Yeah, just cad uh, caddy, you never, you never had that. Yeah, no, snowboarding was it from, the, from, from off the rip. I felt very, you know, I feel very lucky that that's how it went. You know what I mean? Like super lucky, for sure. Mentioned earlier how many people I knew that like, you know, they had it, you know, and maybe just didn't get the opportunities. But, um, but yeah, it's been... It's been really cool, like, having something that's my own. I went went into business for myself after, like, a year and a half of cutting hair, which everyone that had been doing hair a long time is like, it's crazy how early you were able to go into business for yourself. That never happens in the hair world. And I'm like, I don't know anything about the hair world, you know. At this point, I'm just, like, trying to do a good job, you know. And so, I mean, it was, it was you know, I guess for me, like, when you, you know, you get – a different type of satisfaction in the sense that, you know, when you build clientele and you build rapport with people that come to see you, to have their hair cut by you, um, you know, and you, and you feel that loyalty, like, you know, that's kind of that affirmation, like, all right, I'm doing a good job. You know, like I'm, like I'm putting value behind what I do. Hopefully these people know that I care and that I just don't see, uh, money at the end of this or whatever. I mean, yeah, that's a great thing that comes with it. But, you know, at the end of the day, like I'm, I will never, you know, Maybe I'm not going to say never, but I don't think I will ever, you know, make cutting hair what I made snowboarding. But I, I, I don't think that um, I'm someone that was by tax standards rich and I was miserable at a certain point with the money. Like I was fucking miserable. So like I knew that when I get, did get sober, that money was not my problem. Like that was not the issue. Once I was in, I thought it was my issue, like, oh, because because I didn't get the money back from friends or because I didn't, you know, save more, like, I'm here, you know. Um, but it was not a money thing, you know. It was an inside job for sure. And so, you know, I definitely have a different relationship with money now. Um, I got in a lot of trouble with the IRS for not paying taxes. You and that straight was up, how long did you go without paying taxes? Five years. Damn. And uh, they come hunting. Yeah. No, that shit does not go away. Um, I learned a really tough lesson from that. And, uh, you know, it, the whole process from when uh, that happened until I settled with them was about two and a half years. So, from I've never had to like hire a lawyer before and things like that. And, um, 
you know, I wrote them letters and I told them my situation and told them that like, dude, as a drug and, and, you know, just as a drug addict, like I've, I've, you know, abandoned all financial responsibility, including my taxes. You know, I said at the time I was like three years sober, two and a half years sober. I was like, I'm two years sober. I'm active in recovery and sponsor men. Like I'm in a different career. Like I, you know what I mean? Like I continue to, you know, just try in any which way to sort of, and I don't know if that was even taken into consideration, but, um, for them, for the amount that I owed was with some serious cheddar biscuits. Um, I was able to settle for a very reasonable amount. Um, but like probably the most, uh, serious consequence of my drug use, my drug use and my, my drinking for sure. And, uh, super scary too. Cause that like, as life was getting better, you know, like I was, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, like, everything's going good. And, like, you know, I got my barber's license. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Like, I still had this, like, kind of dark secret, I guess, that I was dealing with to where if everything was good, you know, whatever, I'd, like, get a letter in the mail and it'd be from them. And I'm like, oh, my God, another one of these things. And then I'd, like, call my lawyers in California and they're like, oh, no, like, it's all good. Like, they know that you're handling it. Like, don't worry about it. But, like, the turnaround time on that would be a couple days sometimes. So for two days I'm flipping out, like, dude, like, whatever. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, dude, it was super eye-opening, you know, like, if you're <laughs> – if you're making money snowboarding, make sure you got that shit handled for sure. Did you? And if you don't pay shit, I know from experience, it doesn't just go away. They just probably wait for the right time to hit you. And the amount of fees and penalties and things that the they tack on more that, than the they, uh, they compound. Uh, ridiculous, right? dog. Did you consciously not pay taxes because of the drugs? Like you made a decision like, I'm not going to pay these? Or were you just, you didn't have someone telling you to pay the taxes? Mm. I think for a little bit it was – I honestly don't know, dude. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. I think – Just one of those things? It was just one of those things that I kind of thought would just go away yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, like I'm not – You're not going to find me. I don't think I'm like the dumbest person. No, it happens to, <laughs> dude, it happens to a lot of people. Like, but uh, I definitely was – I had – yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it would have been a phone call or two to call somebody who uh, – to figure out what I needed to do. To get things sorted and to get back on track for sure. Um, you know, like I said about pulling money out of my retirement, I thought that because I withheld the taxes that, like, I didn't need to file taxes. And they already have the tax money. Like, why well, would I need to? They're like, no, dude, like, you need to still file even though you withheld the taxes because you have to file. I'm <laughs> like, oh, really? You know, and they're ticking off. Like, I remember when uh, when I got the call from the, the guy at the lawyer whatever the company I was working with to try to help me out and I was at work cutting hair and he was like hey man like do you have can you, can you sit down somewhere <laughs> I was like yeah sure and he starts like he's like well so I'm going through everything here and what you know what I had to go and do is look into at least federal amounts and everything that you had going on and stuff and so he started listing off like all the fees and everything like that and like, dude, just my heart was in my nutsack. It's that stomach drop, you know, and I'm just like pale white walking into work. Like it was just astronomical and like so unexpected. And um, what a freaking, yeah, what a humbling lesson, dude. <laughs> like I definitely <laughs> don't want to do that again. Totally. And there's, um, there, there's something I kind of want to add in, if that's okay. If yeah, yeah, dude, please. Go, go, well, going back to, I mean, talking about not paying the taxes, like Bud's asked earlier, right? When you... <laughs> You, you mentioned that you were basically spiritually bankrupt, right? You had the most money you ever had, but you're boozing more than you ever have, right? And so you go to this space. Of what, what are you doing when you're boozing? You're, you're essentially being like avoidant, right? You're like, if I don't feel good, but if I booze, I'm going to temporarily not think about my problems. And I'm going to go to a temporary space of just putting all my problems under the rug and fucking I'm going to get fucked up and I'm going to be temporarily okay. Whether that's like childhood trauma, fucking IRS taxes, uh, shit, go emotional things happen in relationships. You can take the booze and the drugs and you cover it up. So I think that sometimes the, it's like, like you're just covering things up when you're using from a space of emotional and spiritual avoidance. Uh, and even going back even more, there's so much good shit you said too. I love like when you're talking about how you're using and you think you're like, got it figured out. I'll just drink wine on the weekend <laughs> yeah. and then I'll drink during the week. And I, you see, you know, I did the same thing when I was using and you're like, all right, I, I'm just going to drink at weddings. I'm just going to drink on the weekend. And it's like, dude, you got a fucking eight ball every time you go out. 
rewarding. Like not, but there's always yeah. there's always like these these little lies we tell to ourselves as users is in, incredible. And then it's so funny because you think that you have it figured out. You're like, oh, I got it figured out. I got to figure out. Nobody knows. I'm keeping it together. All of your friends, anybody close to you knows you're using. <laughs> like you're not hiding shit. Nobody's hiding yeah. anything. And then when they're like, you're like, hey man, I have a problem. We're like, yeah, we know. Like obviously. Mm-hmm. And and I love the way that your family uh, dealt with that. And and I kind of wanted to just hit, go right into a hard hitting question because we get it all the time on the show. You know, I talk about sobriety on the show sometimes, and people they reach out all the time. They're like, hey man, I'm having a hard time. Like, what do you recommend? And and so you have been in that place where you've hit your rock bottom. Life it feels unmanageable. Uh, what what do you recommend to the person that's that's in that place, ready to make a change? Um, great question. I would say that uh, <clears throat> I haven't came across anyone trying to get so. You know, I've gotten a lot of people through other. You know, I've done a couple other podcasts and stuff like that. Talked about sobriety, whatever. I'm transparent on my social media about it. I don't like, you know what I mean. Preach it like every time I post something or whatever. But you know, everything that I have in my life today, um, my job, my business, my girlfriend, you know, her son that's in my life, my family, like all the things that I that I have today you know, the, the self awareness, you know, the love for myself, it's all because of sobriety, you know what I mean? Like 100%. Um, without that, like for me, like there's nothing, dude. Um, I would say that anybody, mostly everybody knows somebody who's sober, you know, it's not this like taboo thing anymore, you know, like they either know someone who's sober or like there's something, you know what I mean? Like, so I feel like if, if you know somebody that's sober and they're looks like they're doing okay or like they're happy maybe <laughs> reach out to them you know what i mean shit reach out to me shoot me a dm you know like i definitely like i've helped other people that have reached out snow other pro snowboarders so i'll leave nameless but um hey man i want to kill myself you know like i need help Like, you know, you seem like life is going good for you. What'd you do to get sober and how'd you do that? Loaded question for sure. Cause there's a lot of things that, that, uh, that have got me here and, uh, not guaranteed, you know, like the next days, you know, I I mean, it's, we're all susceptible to like things that can happen, but I think just for today and, you know, take it, you know, day by day, like they say one day at a time, I used to hate that cheesy stuff, (laughs) you know, but it's true, bro. Mm -hmm. Like it really is. You know, whatever, one day at a time for me is now turned into five, some whatever, five and a half years. You got a good amount of time too, going on six years. That's freaking incredible for someone that couldn't stay sober for four fucking days, you know? So it's like, I'm a, I'm a testament. Like if I did it and, um, you know, I had somebody that showed me that sobriety was cool. I don't want that to sound cheesy. No, and that's like, whatever. You. If you think it's whack, like whatever, if you just like whatever took a bump while you're watching this podcast like right on dude rip it like i do not judge my friends or people that i know that still use drugs and drink and stuff or when i'm out at a show or something like i'm not oh that fucker just took a fireball shot it's like no dude that's cool you know what i mean like he's doing his thing like for me like my life is unmanageable with alcohol and drugs it's like it's like i treat it like an allergy dude you know like i'm allergic to it you know um but I think we all either know people in recovery. I feel like there's enough resources mm-hmm. out there, you know, like it was tough for me because I wish that I had known someone like you when I was getting sober, like someone that was sober that had been through the snowboarding thing. Maybe it was transitioning to like another thing like you've kind of done, like with the bomb hole and with like different brands and stuff like that because I feel like I I couldn't relate to anybody and I was like dude I don't even fucking know anyone that snowboards that's sober you know I knew my parents were sober but like well, I'm not going to go talk to them about it then the cats out of the bag that like I I think I have a problem and then like they're going to be cats all out worried of the bag is a big problem you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know but it's like the cat was out of the bag a long time ago and I think that um I come across more people that are like sober curious Yes. You know what I, I mean? I, that it's like they don't really they want to know what it's like. And it's, yeah, like they're maybe going to try cleanse or like try to do a 30 day. And like, dude, like I think that's great. You know, like I'm, I have no uh, like opinion on that, whether it's the right or wrong thing to do. I just know that like, you, you know, uh, you don't have to be like me and destroy your life to get. So I had to do it because I was that like hard headed and thought I knew shit that like I was going to like run it till the end. And like I did. And like, you know. 
I ended up, you know, my last little bit, dude, that I was out, I was homeless living in my car with my dog, dude. It was not fun, you know? Like, it's not like I was, like, uh, you know, destitute or anything like that. But, like, it was, I was, like, I was not have a place to live, you know? And I was just like, how did I fucking end up here, dude? You know, you ask that question. How did I end up here? I had yeah. had a lot of opportunities to get sober before I did. Yeah. Um, when I still had stuff. Like, when I still had some money in my pocket and I still had people in my life that cared about me, that wanted to see me do well, that wanted to see me make a more cleaner transition from snowboarding into whatever that next thing would be. Like I had, it's not like I never had an opportunity to do it. I definitely had opportunities to do it. I just was like, I didn't take it serious or I didn't think that it was that bad or whatever. And I think that, um, you know, it's a very insidious disease, man. It will tell you, like, it will tell you that like, nah, everything's good, dude. That yeah. was just a rough night, dude. Oh, you're shitting blood? Like, nah, dude, that's like, that's just low key. Like, yeah. don't even stress that. Like, it's cool. Like, chill out till Thursday, weekend warrior, that shit. Like, you'll be back. Like, all good. You know, like the, the amount of self justification that mm-hmm. I did for years and years just like led me to so much freaking pain. You know what I mean? But it was, but I was like telling myself that it was all going to work out, dude. I'm going to figure it out. And also, the other, the mm-hmm. other side of that too is the, all right, I'm I'm just going to I'm going to quit drinking for uh, this month. I'm going to go I'm gonna, and then the weekend rolls around and you go out and then when you're drinking you're also like I'm such a piece of shit. Why am I doing this? Why the <laughs> fuck did I said I wasn't going to do it? And the negative self-talk can also be so detrimental. Yeah. It's tough when you kind of have like one foot in, one foot out when mm-hmm. you're like wanting to get sober. People maybe know that you're trying to get sober, but you have this other thing going. On. That's a tough place to be. Yeah. That was probably the place when I was at my worst, you know, when I was trying to like do the meetings thing but then i was like uh i didn't like what i heard like uh dope man what's up Mm -hmm. you know and then i'm like i know i shouldn't be doing cocaine right now like i should not be drinking rumplements Mm -hmm. it makes me cough up blood why am i still drinking it Mm -hmm. ah why am i chasing this rumplements with purple gatorade no one does that like that sounds disgusting but it helps it go down easier like just i don't know just shit like that and so i think that uh yeah, this this sober curious thing is cool. I've seen shit on TikTok about it or whatever. And I'm like, that's cool. I mean, whatever. I, I, I got another wormhole to go down because I notice this happens a lot, especially when talking about sobriety, is that I'll, if it comes up, right, people start, whenever we talk about sobriety, the person you're talking to starts self-judging themselves, right? So they're self-judging and they're like, I wonder if I have a problem. Uh, and they start, like, you know, and, and I think there's listeners that are listening to this podcast that are saying... I wonder if I have a problem. Now, what would you say are uh, some of the things that might go into contributing factor to an alcoholic or a user that maybe lacks awareness or just is curious about what it, what is if if they are or if they're not? I think that um, great question, great wormhole. Let's go. Um, I think that it's what kept me out for a long time. I've never got a DUI. I've never been arrested. You know what I mean? I'm not living under a fucking bridge. You know? That dude that's shooting dope, what a fucking loser, dude. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not him. Why would I need to get sober? Like, I'm not that. Like, I still have a car. I still have a girlfriend and, like, friends that care about me, I think. You know? Like, I still have... So, I mean, it was easy for me to, like, be like, well, I don't that. I don't know. I only drink this much, whatever. It's not... It's more like, what am I like when I drink? doesn't matter if I drink one fucking day a week you know what I mean if I drink and I'm you know blackout black eye fucking bitch like acting like an idiot like that's maybe something to look at dude like maybe you know (laughs) like I'm not saying that (laughs) that makes you an alcoholic also like if you get a DUI that doesn't make you an alcoholic you go out and drink you know you could be coming home from a Christmas party dude and like drink twice a year and get a DUI and shit doesn't make you an alcoholic you know what I mean I was in fucking rehab with a dude that had 16 DUIs, dude. 16? <laughs> yeah. They let him back Fire, out there? Fire, dude. Fire. That's, that's a, messed up. That's an impressive number. I think yeah. that deserves an air horn. Yeah, yeah let's that, man. I can't believe they let him back yeah. out there after yeah. three or four. Geez. Running it. And I'm like, that's that's what's up, dude. You probably have a problem. So they want, they want, <laughs> like, do they want the money? They just yeah. keep letting them back well, out. No, he didn't have, I'm sure he didn't have a license. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so, but, so I think that there's I think that there's different things, but I think that, that more or less, like... Um, how do you feel? You know what I mean? Like, how do you feel like when you drink or when you're not drinking? It doesn't need to be that I drink every, I mean, I drank every day here, and I used every day for like here, a couple of years. Here's a good but, question to ask yourself. Is my life unmanageable? 
Like it's a great are, question. That's that's a huge that's a huge good self awareness question about like, is the is the alcohol affecting my job? Is the alcohol or drugs affecting my personal relationships? Has somebody left me because I was using? Those my, are my those. usefulness to other people. Yeah, my usefulness to myself. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I was telling you this earlier. I was like, dude, I'm five and a half years sober, and I was talking to some. I was talking to a friend about this earlier this week, who is, um, you know, struggling with early sobriety. You know, and we were chit chatting, and I was like, look, man, like I'm five and a half years sober, and I and and my life is like teetering on unmanageability, and I'm sober. You know what I mean? So if I add alcohol or weed or ketamine or whatever back into the mix, dude, like I'm off, dude. Like the business is gone. The relationships, gone. Girlfriend, gone. Family, gone. Like, it's a matter of time, dude. Like, is it going to kill me if I drink tonight? Like, well, probably not. But, like, the re- the repercussions that come with that, dude, the ripple effect, like, not fucking willing to even fuck with that, dude. Like, sobriety's giving me too much, you know? And so that's something that I that I think about. And, like, uh, so it's, it's just, yeah. I mean, those are great questions to ask yourself, you know? How am I serving myself, other people? You know what I mean? How do I feel about myself when I drink, when I don't drink? You know, because there's there's two sides to it. Like, I know how I feel when I drink, but how do I feel when I don't drink? You know what I mean? Is that spring in my chest when someone cuts me off in traffic or I get a phone call that I don't want or I talk to my boss and he pops off or whatever? You know, how does that – do I feel like, oh, drink would – I'm going to fucking happy hour for this, dude. Fuck him. You know, like that's maybe – you know, and and that's just – I mean, yeah, that's how I I drank when I was happy, sad, mad, whatever. So I mean, that was a always my solution. So I mean, if I don't know, it's it's such a it's such a loaded question because I feel like everyone kind of has a different like come to moment. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Sometimes it's forced upon you. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's in jail or prison. You know, sometimes it's. Uh, some t- dude, I have a lot of friends that have died since I've gotten sober. I know, and I, I hate to be like whatever morbid about it or or bring that up, but I mean, it's definitely something that needs to be said since we're on the topic. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, had you know, 2020, Jaeger committed suicide, and then I had like five or six other friends die of overdoses. That was a heavy year, dude. That was when I was like, holy shit, this drop. My my first roommate was in sobriety. Um, you know, died of a drug overdose in September, and that hit home, you know, because he was a homie. Had two years clean at one point. COVID happened, went back out, couldn't come back, couldn't get it back, just couldn't get it right, you know what I mean? Couldn't get it back to back on his feet, and that was like, holy shit, that's a dude that I spent a lot of time with, whatever. And uh, so, we, so you know, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like hard, hard, like weird to go to that extreme and be like, you're going to die if you drink well, it some. Is, it can't be a matter of life or death, though. Yeah, it can. Yeah, I mean, it can. And, like, I, I would say that, like, I had, dude, I'm, I'm definitely on borrowed time. Like, I should, if I didn't get, if I didn't get sober when I did, I'd be dead. I'm 100% convinced of it. There's no other way that I look at it or, like, anything else that other than the fact that whether it was a month, six months, whatever, I'd be dead. And and that would end up, and look at what I would have fucking missed out on, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the shit that, like, and I don't really, like, think about that enough, to be honest with you, dude. Like, I, I get wrapped up in my own problems, my own shit going on, you know, stuff that's maybe trivial, that's not a big deal. Everybody does. It's part of yeah, being human. Yeah. So I try to be cautious, like, who I complain to. But, like, yeah, dude, like, I would have missed out on some pretty cool shit had I not made it, you know. So there is, you know, there is a better way, you know. That- um if you're struggling with controlling your drinking or or thinking about it, try to control your drinking. Try to go to a bar, fucking order two drinks, stop immediately. Hang out in the bar for a while. Go back the next day, order two more drinks. Go back the next day, order two. I can probably promise you that two drinks is going to turn into four drinks, which is going to turn into an eight ball, which is going to, it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's just, I mean, that's For my you, ex- you mean, right? For me. Yeah. For me. Not yeah. for everybody. Not for everybody. Yeah. No, for sure. I think that a lot of people, dude. I know plenty of dudes that can drink totally normal. Yeah, they can have a couple know? drinks, but, or like they drive could, home even well, after like one drink. Let's let's talk about snowboarding for a second, though, because if you think about snowboarding, it's it's about going fucking big. It's about yeah. catching air and getting rowdy and and kind of just pinning it. You know, you're fucking. Mm-hmm. It's a it's gnarly. Like like your fucking adrenaline's up there. You're riding high. You're you're catching air like it's a fuck your highs are high especially when you're doing contests and you're winning you're making a half a million dollars yeah. a year right these highs are high and and 
And then you take that same mentality from the hill and you take that right to the fucking bar and you go fucking big, right? And that's what we do in snowboarding. And yeah. I did that for a long time. It's fucking awesome, right? Yep. Until it's not, right? And then, but it, you know, <laughs> you know, you can run it hot for a while, but if you start, the, the wheels start coming off the bus, it's like the thing that's really important is if the wheels start coming off the bus, there's other ways to live. And that's what you're saying. And I think that's what's powerful for the kids listening to this that, that are maybe teetering on that. That's like yeah. you don't have to live like that. I'm not and, I'm not taking any respect the way from, away from the weekend warriors that can yeah. crush a dog. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it's not just in it's in the business world, it's in the hair mm-hmm. world. You know what I mean? Motherfuckers go hard and they show up and work on Monday and they crush it. And like that's cool that they can do that. Like I think that's awesome. And I think that's the standard, you know, like most of my, most clients that I know that are around my age, you know, they work really hard during the week. They go out Friday and Saturday, Sunday, fun day, watch football and they kind of rinse and repeat. I think that's pretty normal. I think that's kind of like pretty normal, especially for us here in America. You know what I mean? But, uh, I was the Thursday to Sunday and then the Monday to Wednesday. You know what I mean? At least that's what it got to. Initially it was weekend warrior. And then that started, that gap started to close, you know what I mean? And so, that's just, you know, that's just my deal and whatever. But, dude, like, people can run that and do that. And, um, you know, and they're perfectly uh, good, loving people out there that are good humans that binge drink on the weekend. And, like, that's cool. Like, that's not my place to interfere and inter- interject or have an opinion about. You know, it doesn't take anything away from you as a person if you drink or do drugs. And, you know, like, I... Like Chris was saying, dude, I did it, that shit for a long time, and I don't want to sit up here and be a hippie. Oh, drugs are bad. Oh, blah, blah, blah. This is just my experience and what happened. And, uh, you know, if that's your deal, like, word, I had a lot of fun doing all that shit. And I had a lot of good stories from it and, you know, some bad stuff that happened and whatever. But, you know, it is what it is. Speaking of good stories, it's I heard fun you, till it wasn't. Huh? You, you smoke weed with uh, a certain celebrity once. I smoked weed with Montel, dude. Montel Jordan. Montel Williams. Oh, Williams. TV host at Sundance. Oh, I've heard randomly. a couple people say that. Actually, yeah, yeah. I think he's got glaucoma or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But it was kind of a random thing. I think like I want to say that J.P. Solberg like knew his daughter or something uh. like that. I don't, or someone in the Unink crew like knew him, and we were on a trip there, and it. <laughs> happened it was yeah it was cool i mean it was like one of those things where like oh my god because i watched that trash tv shit yeah. i love it classic <laughs> jerry jerry you know a lot of you're not the father loved it mm-hmm. loved Get that it. shit up all right we're gonna take a quick break and talk to you guys about bubs naturals now what is bubs naturals so they're a company that makes all kinds of products but the one that i like the best is their collagen protein powder now i like to take this mix it in a smoothie i take two scoops Throw it in a smoothie with some blueberries, banana, almond butter, some chia seeds, uh, some some uh, oat milk. Mix it all up. You got yourself a great smoothie. And the thing that's great about it, with two scoops of collagen in there, you get 20 grams of protein. And as you get older, your body kind of loses its ability to synthesize this protein. So you got to get it in the system if you want to keep snowboarding when you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, if you want to be 110 and still be able to make twist, or just turn down the hill for that matter, you got to take care of your body. So that's what's cool about Bubs. Uh, it's a company that comes from the world of snowboarding. So, you know, snowboarders for snowboarders here. And you're supporting a great brand. 10% of all of their profits go to charity. So if you want to take care of your body, head on over to bubsnaturals.com. Use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off. Again, bubsnaturals.com, promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off. I usually go through about two of these jugs a month if you're getting a lot down the gullet. So, again, bubsnaturals.com, promo code BOMBHOLE. All right, it is time for the pub beer crap shoot, buds. Are you going to crack some can? I'm going to crack a can, boys. It's, it's, uh... It is time. Respect. <sighs> Now, if you're thinking about getting completely cross-eyed and drinking 78 to 150 beers. I like to say pie-eyed. Yeah, exactly. Waking up in a bush covered in your own urine or having one or two beers responsibly, what are you going to choose, bud? That's more my style these days, and it's uh, pub beer every time. Okay, love it. Uh, What you got to do is roll the dice right there. Roll me? Two dice, my friend. Two dice, and we'll tell you what you got to do. We got a six and a four. That's a ten. Goon gear is a six. Oh, this is a good good question. Perfect ten. Perfect ten. 
What is the biggest prize check ooh, you've ever won? Good question for this guy. Let's just talk about the day. Okay, Tell us. Last contest. <clears throat> last contest that I won was Dew Tour in Tahoe. Oh nine. That's one of the contests that I that I beat Sean legit. Like Sean got third. I think Steve Fisher got second. We competed in the rain. It's definitely for me my best performance. I'm kind of glad it was the last contest I won because I'm yeah. like I, I put it all out. Went there. out on top. Smoked two fat doobies that morning because it was pouring rain. I was like, this is miserable weather. I'm gonna make the most of it. We'll see what happens. So I think that was like I think the check itself was like 20k, and then probably with bonuses we're at like 40 or 50. Like to, in total, got like another 20, 25 maybe for like prize matching and stuff like that. But then we went to Reno and we went and gambled. And I rolled for like, uh, I hit on roulette and won like 3,500. And then I hit on blackjack for like another two. So Jeez, it dude. was, yeah, it was just like a day, you know, and like, like a year's salary for some people. Yeah. And we'd always like, if, if we're was like, if it was like a, was like a Tahoe person. contest and stuff, we usually always go and like do Reno up and like whatever, do the, do the, the 1% speed. rule and, went into or 10% <clears throat> rule. Was it I don't really think I ever like really did. I think we just, I don't think there's ever really like a number, but I definitely, I think between the boys, like, Oh no, I got this bar tab, this bar tab, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a big day for what sure. A day, yeah. Getting it kind of like it was sort of like the last contest of the year too. So it was, yeah. And then, um, yeah. And then I like never did as good in the contest after that. So that was the <laughs> perfect. It's a good thing. Perfect. Well, it's time for hot takes. This is a great part of the show. Fan favorite. Fan favorite. Uh, we're actually not even sure if it is, but mm. we just say that. I like to say it is. So we always start it's off bad. with who is the Michael Jordan or the greatest of all time to you. As it pertains to, to you, you, both male and female. Mm. Uh, for me, Michael Jordan, uh, for me, is Terrier. That's mine. Um, yeah, he's just an awesome. And he's just like a really rad dude, too. Like, also really cool. Female, uh, I'm going to say um, past. I'm gonna say two because I feel like I feel like current has got to be Jamie Anderson for sure, and I love Jamie. I've been you know seeing her since forever. I've been competing again, not against her, but just seeing her at contests since I don't know she was really really little. And then I would say past. Um, we got probably like um, Takitas. Tara, I knew he was gonna go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer. always just you know. Definitely a, a pioneer in many many ways for sure. For sure, always she's, and and she's cool too. Leveled sure. up the game. Yeah. Uh, okay. Most underrated. Most underrated. Never met him. Don't know him. Uh, kid named Riley Johnson that rides at Highland. His Instagram is mids for the kids. I'm a big fan. If you're listening or watching. Okay, he's got the heat. All right, steel or powder. Powder. Best style ever. Mm. Uh, uh, brushy. Ooh, nice, dude. Damn, I thought for sure you're going Danny. Well, I mean, that's. I mean, it's I like, like love time. I love, yeah, let's. Get, I love that. Uh, but like Danny is like. I mean, I feel like we talked a lot about Danny. You know, we don't want to pump his ego. Yeah, true. Yeah, not Danny. It's you know, not like Danny. It's definitely not Danny. Danny it's definitely not Danny. M- one of the most influential on me, but like best style ever. And Brushy's an awesome dude too. Dude, Brushy, well. some of those grabs, man. man. Woo, baby. Yeah. Hell of a poker player. Yeah. Hell of a poker player. True. Okay, best snowboard video ever made. Mm. To you. Robot food, anything, honestly, for me. Any food. Yeah. Any robot food. Yeah. Uh, best board graphic ever? Mm, I would say uh, the Hawking Sprocking Cat. I have a tattoo of it on my arm, too. Mm-hmm. Nice. It's my favorite. Pants over the high back or under the high back? In the back? Yeah. Under. What, like... Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's high back. No, not over. No, that's the correct answer. Yeah, that's absolutely the correct. And answer. and over the and over the strap too. Like when it gets tucked in. Like I don't know. I feel like no one goes over the strap anymore. And maybe that's like I'm an old guy for thinking that that's that's hot. But I think the the tucked in the strap too is like not a vibe. Mm-mm. But that's just I think that's just preference. You yeah, know? love that answer. Okay, if you go heli boarding with three people, just good times, ripping powder. Who are you taking? Mm. 
uh, Travis Rice so he can show me how not to die. <laughs> you can take celebrities too. Yeah. I'm just gonna throw. Oh, them for there. real? You can take whoever you want. Anyone, anyone you want to put in that alley, dude. But I, but don't don't let that derail your original yeah. answer. No, I don't want to derail it. Uh, I'll just stick with snowboarders. Um, Travis, let's say, uh, Nick Russell, and um, I'm gonna say uh, E Jack. Just see a Kelly right yeah. there. It's a yeah. lot of cool stuff's gonna go down. Yeah, respect to all those dudes. My like favorite pal, big mountain dudes. A lot of the time. Okay, worst trend. What do you got? Mm. Uh, snowboarders not making enough money anymore. <laughs> God, you know, like you see the level of riding. We've talked about it, you know. It, yeah, I mean, these dudes are crazy, dog. You know, for sure. <laughs> um, but maybe like a yeah, I would say maybe the side of that. Um, I feel like there's an, there's another one. Uh, no, let's just stick with that. They deserve to get paid more. Okay, good answer. Well, that does it for hot takes. Uh, man, there's a there's a couple other things I want to cover. First things, we talked about this in the Patreon interview that we did before the actual show. Uh, but you mentioned a quote about comparison. Comparison is a thief of joy. And what you, <laughs> you're like, well, it's a th- that's Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> it is. <It's> really, <laughs> the Chris quote. is a freaking, Very like, you about to go Chris. steal the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> this guy, dude. This guy is well read. This guy's the, Nick Cage. Well bro. read. Yeah, Theodore Roosevelt. Elaborate, yeah. elaborate on that. Going to, oh, going to you know what I mean? National treasure. <laughs> for sure. Historian. It's actually, it's actually Nick Cage from the Cage Rage montage on YouTube. I don't know if you've ever seen <laughs> I've that. I've seen that, but I want to look that up. I want to, I want to look that up. <laughs> it's him going berserk uh, for cage rage. A, about two minutes of him. Just type in Cage Rage on YouTube. I want to see that. Sorry, continue. Uh, no, I think that uh, it is, it is, man. It mm-hmm. really is. I think that my... Um, had this really quick come up in snowboarding and I had this sort of quick downfall and then I had a slow come up in my sobriety and my life what it is now and it's still kind of creeping you know what I mean so I'm trying not to get too you know focused on the destination and just like enjoy the ride you know it's kind of cheesy to say but um I think that there's been times where uh my joy has been like stripped from like the the wins and things that I have going on in my life based on how I like see how other people are doing you know and so i think just to like be able to shift that and just like what does it look like for me to just be happy for other people and like what they have going on and like their success and like their families or like the good things that are happening for them like um i think like that vibe is only going to bring me better things in my life you know it doesn't really it doesn't it's not really like going to serve me to like be jealous or like compare or whatever. And I think it's so easy with social media, dude. It's so easy with whatever Facebook or, you know, just seeing, um, cause everything's like the highlight reel, you know what I mean? Um, you know, so with whatever it is, I mean, you know, even on my, like on my, on my barbershop page, like I post all the haircuts that I like, you know what I mean? There's some that maybe I'm like, yeah, it was okay, but you know, I don't love it. Like I'm not going to post a picture of that, you know? So I think that it's kind of true as well with people's things going on in their life, you know. Uh, I definitely still have struggles and, you know, things that happen and stuff like that. But I think that, um, yeah, dude, stop comparing yourself. Don't let it thief your joy and try to be happy for other people. Um, you know, if if you're in transition, you know, build on the small victories and the good things that you have going on for sure. Um, all that other shit is just extra. Damn, Mace is dropping bombs beautiful. on the pod the whole Am time. He's a this has been this year is a pure <laughs> beautician, especially with that lettuce, dude. Yeah. Can we talk about the hair Let's flow talk for about a second? That yeah, it's a it's a good looking set of set of I lettuce. I mean, there. so I had to like when I went to rehab. What I was most upset about in going to rehab was I had to shave my facial hair and cut my hair, and my hair wasn't nearly as long as it is right now, but. uh I was devastated. Did they make you do that? I was rehab, devastated. Yeah, I think they just wanted a little hair. bit of like, um, I think they just, it's not like order, but just like a little bit of structure. Yeah, I think structure. it's like kind of what they sort of strive for. So yeah, you kind of keep your hair a little shorter, shave every morning. Just some little, little rules that you have at that, at that particular place. But uh, when I got out, I was like, dude, not shaving. Yeah. So I like, grew my beard out for two years. The shit was like, you know, it was Stone like cold. how yours was a little longer. Two years, was, huh? yeah. Yeah. Like, like, like 22 months. 
less than a year yeah. right here. And then, um, yeah, just went on. I was like, dude, you know, in my 30s, my hair is going to grow. I'm fine as well fucking grow it, you know. And now it's, yeah, now it's long as shit. And you got just, a beautiful just man riding like the wave, that. You got to let it grow, I'm just right? riding the wave. I've had long hair more or less forever, but, yeah, this is definitely the longest it's ever been, and I'm enjoying it. Natural curls? Looks good. Yeah. Spewing out of the bucket. Out of the, the back of the yeah, bucket. Yeah, dude, I hope Looks we can get a good. clip of that. The dude, hockey just, haircut. You know, Flow and yeah. there. Half the half the deal is looking the part, dude. Absolutely you know? for real. Like hundred percent. Look good, feel good. You feel good, you play good, you play good, they pay good. They pay good. Ooh. Words of Dion Sanders. I get that wrong sometimes. I've said maybe Ocho Cinco or something. But I it's say a Dion Theodore, Sanders. Theodore Roosevelt. It could be yeah. Originally it might have been Theodore. I think yeah. it was Theodore. <laughs> uh okay. Well, to wrap things up, first of all, too, um, where can people find you if they wanna they wanna reach out? Um, what's plug? If you need to plug some stuff, plug it in right now. Yeah, uh, at Mace in the place, M A S E I N the place on Instagram. I mean, I'm on Facebook a little bit from time to time. Yeah, man. If you're struggling, reach out to me. If you just want to say hi, say hi. I'm usually I usually respond and stuff. I don't have a ton going on. This is my business called Barbercraft. And if you're ever in Charleston, South Carolina, you want to come get a haircut from me, come say hi. Stop by. I'd love to have you in my chair. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay. And lastly, we want to know if you want to throw any thank yous out. Yeah. Thank you to you guys, man. Thank you to, um, you know, family, friends, my girlfriend, Summer, um, you know, everyone that's, you know, supported me. Um, you know, I I would say that, you know, I, I at a certain point in my life, I pushed away about every single person that cares about me. And, you know, all those people gave me a second chance, you know, when I started to turn my life around. So, you know, for anybody that I didn't mention, thank you for, you know, believing in me, having in my back, having my back. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, live better each day, dude. I mean, some days are better than others, but, you know, I'm here grateful to be here super grateful to be able to come on the pod dude and hang with you guys super rad opportunity was stoked when you hit me up absolutely had to make it happen so killer good to, good to see you again man likewise dude likewise it's been a fun chat i want to say thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your powerful journey with mm -hmm. us because that's i mean i was just glued to the edge of my seat in that conversation so thanks again for that thank uh, you. i want to say thank you to all of our listeners everybody that tunes in uh, everybody that buys merch, everybody that supports us. And uh, we're really just a, one big snowboard community. So uh, try to have each other's back out here. And so we appreciate you guys a lot. And uh, we got another episode coming at you next Wednesday. Over and out from the bomb hole.